wow. Woof. You know, just the, even like the memory of this film, Jonathan, <laughs> it, it really, wow. I, I, I think the fact that we didn't really know what we were getting into. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, absolutely. I had no idea what the project really was or what it was about. So sitting down to actually watch it was really incredible <laughs> really incredible <laughs> i mean yeah well that's the best compliment that uh, that i can get really uh, not expecting anything and then and literally sometimes not expecting anything because when you when you make we talked about our skit actually mm. when you make little uh, indie films most people expect um, the lowest of the lowest possible mm. quality mm -hmm. yeah which, given so, uh, you know what's actually in mainstream cinemas right now, is not fair at all. But there you yeah. go, right? There you go. But it's what what I remember when I was watching it. What I was thinking, what was going through my mind was, I can't remember the last time a film made me feel so profoundly. And, you know, some of those emotions were, were negative, obviously, because that's what yeah. the film is about, right? That's what the film is designed to do. And I was thinking to myself, you know what? There's so little in cinema at the moment, certainly on, like, mainstream platforms that allows you to feel this way or that wants you to feel this way. You know, the, the prescription of emotion and response is so narrow right. on the platforms that we have at the moment. Mm -hmm. I think, I think the, the thing is that it's, it's all about safety. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, what we see, what we see a lot on uh, on, um, especially on platforms, etc., is, is films that aren't going to to well, for the most part. Let's not generalize mm -hmm. too much, but mm -hmm. for the most part, films that are going to cuddle the the audience and give them exactly what it is that they want. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And for exactly me, the that. the point of being indie and making making something with so little, uh, because the budget was thirty five thousand pounds. <laughs> what? <is> insane. Yeah. <laughs> That's mad. I did not I, I mean I knew the budget was low, but I did not know it was like so yeah. literally for nothing, really. Thirty five thousand pounds uh total. Wow. So, I've gotta be honest, I would not have thought that was possible. I would I would not have pegged <laughs> that I'm watching the film, right? Well, that's what I mean. Just watching yeah, the film that's it, extraordinary. It, I would that is not the, the number. I'd have I put on I, it, you know? I, I don't think anybody thought that was, including me, <laughs> I don't <laughs> think anybody thought that was possible. Um, uh, but, you know, you have to make do. And, and the point, for me, the point of doing something with so little is that you can take risk and, um, yeah. and, and, and take the risk to make people feel really bad. That's fine. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. It's a bleak film. It's, yeah. and, and it was, if I'm honest, it was bleak from the script writing. Um, mm. Because when I sent the one of the versions to someone who was supposed to give us uh, some money, and he, he ended mm -hmm. up giving us the money, but the the version he read, he said, "Oh, I don't know. I, I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's a bit bleak for me, Jonathan." And I said, "Well, <laughs> look, you know, I promise well, you it will be good." Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it, yeah. it's surely yeah. doing its job, then, right? If it's making you feel that way just from the script, that is really what it's there for. I mean that's why I made it. Yeah, sure. I, I, I wanted I wanted people to that, who watched it to feel those emotions. And and mm -hmm. I, funnily enough, and we discussed that a lot with uh, with all of the script write, script writers that ended up working on this film. Is we also wanted mm -hmm. it to be quite an uplifting experience in the end. Mm -hmm. So kind of a life affirming experience. I mean, the, the thing yeah. that really struck me, and I kind of hinted at this in the review, and I, I, by the way, we didn't talk about this in terms of, at the start in terms of format. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to suggest that we maybe we try and keep the first hour of the conversation spoiler free, and then we get heavy into spoilers second half. I know that yeah. okay. cuts against our normal style, George, of just yeah. jumping all over the place. But I <laughs> just think, chatting about anything, whatever. Yeah. Well, I just think it gives us the opportunity. Then it gives people who haven't seen the movie and don't want to be spoiled an opportunity to hear us talk about it in general terms, and then we can do. Do you know what I mean? So if, if yeah, yeah. So if we, but if we're talking in general terms, then I mean that's something I obviously I mentioned in the review. I mean, I, it's difficult because I didn't want to talk too much about the movie's resolution because I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it. But I think mm -hmm. um, so. Maybe we'll get more into this into hour two. But I certainly think it, uh, one of the things I, that really hit me about the film was 
it it wouldn't have been possible actually for it to be as bleak as it was if it hadn't also had as much heart as it did that's, that's the it, two yeah. the two components are actually inseparable for me and i think i think one of the things that 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 made a lot of the mainstream cinema misses that this movie kind of really reminded me about it's like it, yeah, this movie is dark and it's bleak and uh it's often quite uh merciless in some ways but what it mm. what it is never is it's never cynical that's it that's exactly it there's a difference between bleakness and cynicism yeah isn't? i think so yeah, the film and, is not nihilistic no it's absolutely. not nihilistic you know it's even at its darkest it's talking about very very human things things that are you know awfully relatable mm. in many ways i mean for me it was the dynamic obviously the dynamic between matt and ewan was the the, the, the anchor point for me I'm not going too deep into spoilers at the moment, but that I, and it's the subtlety with which you did it, Jonathan. That's well, what I you. love. That's what thank I love you. because you never really, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to spoil it too much, but you never really get like exposition on what's happening there. No, no. And, and that, that was important to me. I, um, and I mean, I can't take full credit for all these subtleties to be fair. There's <laughs> been, there's been, a ton of drafts on that script and we'll we'll probably go into more details on the process mm, of course, of course. but um but essentially the way that i that i worked it is i did something like 11 or 12 drafts or something and then i got uh-huh. uh, sarah my wife wrote uh wrote a, a huge part of the script that was actually never shot because we we ended up giving up on that bit because mm-hmm. we, we were running out of money and mm-hmm. um and then obviously we we had michael mckenzie and kat ellinger and and these two um added quite a lot of things uh, in terms of plot uh, michael was the one who kind of oiled up the plot and then all these subtleties that you're talking about uh kat was responsible for quite a few of those mm-hmm. um where she added little lines of dialogue little moments mm-hmm. that that made a, that made a lot of difference um and yeah i i i mean i love that i love that you that you think that it's not a, a nihilistic film um mm. i in any in any case certainly it wasn't cynical uh in terms of we weren't thinking oh what can we do that's super dark you know yeah mm. right we were, we we were just thinking in terms of the journey of these characters and how can they how can they get to to a, a time in their life where things change for them in a significant way and in order to do that you have to put things things in their way and i think coming back to to the way that that uh, modern films tend to treat their audiences i think what's missing in a lot of them is that they tend to not want to put their characters through genuinely horrible things mm-hmm. because they think mm-hmm. that if you love your characters you don't put them through through genuine difficulties and and i didn't want to think that way i i i loved i loved the character of abby and i loved the character of matt and to some extent i yeah. also loved the character of ewan mm-hmm. and and ben you know all these characters the only one i didn't have much love for was cal but maybe that's the problem maybe no one loves him you know mm-hmm. um, yeah <laughs> but you love these characters um and that that means you have to the honesty that you have to have towards them is to not pull back and Absolutely, not hold people. Yeah, I mean, with with characters like Ewan, for example, it would have been so so easy for them to have been one note, you know, for them to be totally yeah, irredeemable. No, absolutely. Absolutely. But there's so much going on. I mean, a lot of this is in the performance as well as the script. I mean, oh, yeah. the performance is amazing. I was, I was it's watching. Totally. I, you know, I, I could go through the film and you know pause on some of the the, the unspoken stuff. That the actor who plays Ewan does, that the yeah. looks that he throws Matt's way sometimes. And the way I was reading it was like he you can see something in Matt that he doesn't like. He can see this sort of mm. this burgeoning identity, which Matt may not even be like consciously aware of. And yeah. to him, in his sort of hyper masculine state, it's something to stamp down on. It's it's a weed, it's something negative that has to be stamped down on. And I just I love the sort of consciousness of that within the performance, but it's like there's no the, it doesn't do the, the the Hollywood thing of getting the characters around a table and having them say, well, this is happening and I'm doing this because of this and I'm trying to help you because of this. You don't need that, and it's oh, that's no. that I loved I loved about the film. And, and you're right, a lot of the performance is um, definitely a source of all the things that you discussed. Um, and with Pete, Pete Bird's the name of the, the actor, and he's, yeah. he's, he's amazing. I mean, 
Just uh, in fact, you met oh. him. Yeah, I met Pete. I was <laughs> going to say this because because I I, I, I I'd met Pete and, and you know you uh, Jonathan, you and I, and Pete actually went out for a meal briefly, didn't we? After the yeah. after we'd finished, right. 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 and it still took me about twenty minutes of staring at you and in the film to be like, holy shit, that really is That's Pete because yeah, it's an extraordinary it performance. It is entirely cool. entirely unlike him. And, yeah, and uh, yeah, we had we had a. See, so what, 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 I, what I really loved in both your reviews is how you picked up on, on different things and different elements of, of, of the film. And I know, in a sense, it would be easy to come after the fact, read the review and then say, oh, yeah, we totally meant that and it was on purpose. <laughs> um, but in, in this case, uh, it's true. We discussed it endlessly. Um, and the, one aspect of you and that we discussed in great, great, great details is that this entire thing also stems from an unspoken desire on his part. Yes. And so, yeah. and, and so there is this, that idea that he himself wants what he sees Matt having yes. and he's unable to. I, I loved that. Honestly, I was yeah. watching the film and I was having that wonderful, you know, that creeping realization you sometimes get with media when you're like, is it, is it saying this? Is it going there? And then it, it sort of exploded in my mind. It's like, yes, it, it absolutely is. I mean, you and i i loved it i loved that so so much because you even i mean you know we there is a lot of, of of queer fiction out there now there's a lot of fiction by gay creators and about that experience but there's so there's so little that explores this particular manifestation of the experience you know yeah, uh, and and um uh, but, but you're right it was it, it was important that we didn't explain that it had to be for me it had to be it, it had to be felt mm. yeah and it's in it's in little details in little things in 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 ewan's obsession with with uh homosexuality for example mm. yeah like, well, it's, it's, it's sort of hyper masculinity yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. it's know, constantly it's, bringing that up but then when yeah. when you see him with his friends it's also kind of very uh bordering on on homoeroticism where mm -hmm. they they kind of yeah. they they touch each other and they you know there's that male contact that could be seen as uh hyper masculine or well, as 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 a as a kind of hidden desire and when he sees that absolutely. in his brother he feels the, he kind of feels the need to crush it and that's what we discussed a lot with Pete yeah it was, well, I it think, was amazing. I, I think there's that. also the fact that his his brother's friend is kind of unapologetically presenting as you know, yeah. as as queer or at least as you know outside the mainstream. I mean, that's the other thing I found interesting is that, that I'm sorry, I'm blanking on that other character's name, but the the um, you know that that yeah the um that the the friend of the of Matt is, is uh, James is, yeah James thank you yeah that James is like it just James that's how James looks that's how James chooses to present to the world right and there's no yeah. there's no like I, I mean, I really appreciated that because as someone who grew up in a kind of, I mean, I grew up in a very kind of, I mean, small towns to bigger description for the, the rural yeah. area of the country. Like <laughs> there were a few of us that were kind of, you know, either sort of semi invested in what little we knew about the kind of the punk or goth subcultures. Um, and it wasn't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily a sign of queerness. It wasn't necessarily not a sign of queerness, but it was definitely a sign of otherness. You know, it was a, <laughs> it was a conscious decision to go for otherness and it, you know, it led to people getting beaten up from time to time. So I got, I got some yeah. flashbacks <laughs> during the course of watching some of those sequences. Absolutely. But yeah. Again, I mean, that's the other thing, right? The fact yeah. that it speaks so powerfully to very particular experiences yeah, and you are going to get that, you know, when you get uh, audience members of certain demographics watching the film, they are going to see sequences like that and they are going to have their flashbacks to their yeah, own it's... experience and it, it was beautifully drawn yeah well thank you i mean it it it, it was uh, always a worry uh, when when we had the script and when we were shooting this and and you, you're kind of stuck in a in a in between place where you don't want to go over the top and overboard mm -hmm. and and make the characters too obvious or into stereotypes or cliches at the same time you want to tell enough that people can extract that information i mean they have to pay attention and that's always been a thing for me is i want people to pay attention and if they pay attention it will be rewarding but they have mm -hmm. to pay attention um uh, so it's in there but we didn't want to we didn't want to just point massive arrows going hey look this is this is the thing that you need to look at look at this uh, I, I think it needed to be in subtle body language and and relationships and and um i mean it's an interesting it's an interesting thing that you mentioned james because this this is kind of a triangle of 
Mm. Uh, there's that triangle relationship between you and uh, Matt and James, and mm. um, and and it's it's almost it it's almost a reflection of then later on the relationship between Matt, James, and Ben when they're in his flat. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Because, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because the, the the it's kind of the same dynamic of uh, the innocent who's who's but, who, but kind of get punished in some ways, and then the one who doesn't step in knows there's something wrong, and then the one who actively tries to to sabotage the entire situation. Um, I mean, there's yeah. also, I think, a, a triangle, although it's drawn in a more interesting temporal way between Matt, Ewan, and Abigail, right? Yeah, of um, course. Yeah. That's yeah. the other triangle, I think, that, that you have that triangular relationship, even though obviously that one plays out and manifests in very different ways because of the, you know, because of the, the plot. But I think that that, yeah, that's really interesting to think about those. Because, I mean, the sequence, I mean, we'll, we'll probably get into it more when we get into spoilers, but I did think the sequence in the flat with Ben was, was fascinating. And, and talking earlier about what you're saying about rewarding moments and about about the detail i i was and i think uh george you and i talked about this briefly last time we chatted the scene where ewan describes the reason that he's kind of annoyed mm-hmm. with ben mm-hmm. and it's it, what i loved again with the layers to that because george you and i were both saying weren't we like there's one layer of like um the degree to which we trust you and as a reliable narrator which we don't right we know mm-hmm. it's prone exactly to exaggeration that. self-mythologizing but there's also within that there's also the layer that that there's a moment during that scene where i felt anyway that ewan seemed to actually not just be entertaining the notion but in some way seemed enticed by it genuinely you know and part of the reason for his reaction i think felt to come from uh, a concern with you know some confusion he was maybe feeling himself in the moment and that again that's all in the performance and and the lighting and the way it's shot but you know i think yeah i just I, i really appreciated that I really appreciate moments like that that your mind would return to when you finish watching a film and just be like, oh, right, yeah, just sort of, you know, playing it over again and sort of picking apart a little bit. Um, and again, the, absolutely. Scene, uh, the, scene Sorry, in que- the scene in question, and I don't want to spoil, so I won't describe it in, in the, maybe later, but uh, yeah, I won't yeah. describe it in detail. But the scene in question, it was entirely deliberate, and I told Pete to 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 do it that way as much as mm. possible, even to mm-hmm. the point of, of maybe, you know, um, um, physical contact almost right. Uh, right, yeah. <laughs> and and then then it there was a little detail on dean's hand dean who plays ben there was a thing with his hand that we choreographed so it would feel almost uh, like an erotic moment mm. and uh, mm-hmm. and then it it kind of goes the other way but um yeah all of that all of that was absolutely um calculated from the start and and likewise you know the the triangle dynamic uh between the characters um there's there's a notion in the script where i was very concerned that it would get repetitive because i wanted it to to be um for abby's journey and Matt's journey to be mirror images Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. constantly so even if it's in little details little things that they do in a similar way or they look they look at each other in the mirror at some point or i Mm. wanted it to because by the time we 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 reached the end and the end scene, I wanted for 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 the audience to instinctively figure out that at that moment, Abby figures out that she is um, the same as Matt. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the risk was that because there's a kind of repet- repetition of scenes at different in different time frame, even though they work slightly differently, the risk was that it would get repetitive. So we had to find solutions around that as well. Absolutely, um, yeah, and it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. At all. What it what it feels like is what it's intended as. It feels like poetry. It feels like mm-hmm. a story reaching a a very very natural conclusion. I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff I want to get into here, but I think we'll, that I, I want to save for hour two when we get into spoilers. So, can, if you don't mind, can we? I mean, we'll, we'll come back to all this, but if I, I want to take yeah. a step back for a minute and talk about. So, one of the things that you talked about at the start was the 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 insane budget that you were working to, and, and yeah. it's just I still I'm you know I'm still kind of staggered by that. But <laughs> one of the things that I think that I mean, knowing that and thinking about the movie, one of the things that I was incredibly impressed by was your use of location. Um, mm-hmm. So I'd be really interested in hearing a bit about like the the kind of the practical side of how you scouted uh, the location because they, I mean, 
you have locations in there that that have put high big budget movie sets to shame <laughs> and i suspect the reason for that is because they're authentic right they're real yeah yeah, yeah. Real. Real and location. you kind of can't beat real but yeah, yeah i mean i would you could you talk a little bit about that because i don't i know nothing about that part of the filmmaking process yeah but. I mean, the, the difficulty when, when, especially when you're trying to work on a on a low budget, is that every every step of the process of filmmaking needs to be in line with your idea of budget. So right. you can't just write the thing and then go, oh yeah, I think it's going to cost a hundred thousand pounds. You've got to go, you've got to do it the other way. You've got to go. Well, I think I can raise such five thousand uh-huh. pounds, and so I'm going to start my writing with that in mind. Mm. Right. So when you write your locations. As you write, you're already searching the locations you could possibly use, okay, for your budget. Mm. Uh, same when you write a scene, you go, well, okay, can we afford? Can we afford the shotgun? Can we afford the car? Can we afford this? Mm-hmm. Can we afford that? Mm-hmm. You write it all so that it, you start costing your things up as you write them. And so basically, you you as you're writing it, you're doing location scouting at the same time time you usually using a lot of uh, the internet to find stuff like the prison or uh-huh. like the flat and stuff like that mm, see how mm. much is cost wow. you see if it's possible and you do the same with the characters that you write did the, the number of characters that you can write is an important one right yeah. of course. Uh, yes. and then of course what you don't do is hire a location scout you just do it yourself you go out <laughs> you, go, you, you take some pictures um and and there's there's something to be said then about keeping it to your own to your own city um, right because obviously i've been i've lived in hereford for 16 years and i know it very very well uh, right. so i know the bits that look urban i know the bits that look um and again so about co- coherence i wasn't going to write my script thinking about writing a big urban thriller i wanted a small town neo-noir right right uh, right and so all that goes into all that goes into your writing. If you start uh, if you start your scene and the first thing you see is a high rise, you know, from London or something like that, that's not something you're going to be. That's going to be in line with either your budget or the story you're trying to tell with that budget. Right. And so in terms of location, it's the same logic. Um, we wrote I wrote all these scenes and then we we went out. We knew the ones that were that were going to cost a bit of money was the prison. Yeah. Yeah. And then the the flat, basically, uh, Ben's flat. And the way we got around that, and that's madness, I don't recommend it, but literally all the scenes that were shot in the prison were shot in one day. All wow. Of okay. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This was, it was a race. Um, it was a long day, though, right? Yeah, <laughs> wow. It was a long day, and it was carefully, carefully planned so that we, right. we would know exactly in what order we were shooting, Right. Uh, where, what time the extras would arrive, what time we would need the extras to be gone, what time we would need to leave the prison. So we had literally just, and of course it didn't go according to plan because they, they, they forgot we were coming, so they opened two hours late. Oh, oh wow. no! <laughs> yeah, although uh, fair due, and I probably should give him a, a, a mention, but the, the guy who, who ended up coming, funnily enough, from Hereford um, to open the prison, Ended up letting us stay very late. He was very sorry that he did. Right. Oh, okay. So you got you got uh, time back at the end of the day. So we did get the so wow. But then it, it moves everything two hours along. So your, your extras still come at the same time, and right. you've got two hours where you you don't quite know what to do with them. So we we figured it out. Uh, mm-hmm. I sent uh, I basically sent somebody with a second camera to film some some B roll with the prisoners. Mm-hmm. And then again, you know, coming back to the budget, you have to see, well, how much does it cost to dress everybody in prison uniforms for the UK? You know? Right, uh, right. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, it's, so you have to, it, it's, yeah. It's, I think the important thing is, to, is to, to do every single part of the process with the budget in mind. Because now you, now you discuss it, I'm thinking about, like, the, it, my memory is the editing in that prison sequence is, is pretty interesting as well, right? Because you're jumping between the kind of the the traditional kind of pane of glass interview room that we're familiar with and the, the wider prison, right? Those two mm-hmm. scenes yeah. are running in parallel and you're cutting between them. Um, so was that, uh, was the, the, the plain glass area, was that, was that shot in the same prison or was that shot? Same prison, yeah. That was the same prison. So that really was all done in the same, Christ. Yeah, yeah. We we shot those, we shot Suzanne in the morning Mm. and then Pete in the afternoon 
Right. And then there's a cut scene that's not in the final cut of uh, Mike. So Matt, who actually comes out of uh, of the prison, is walking down the corridor, and and right. we've just kept the end of that scene with the button and the gate that opens. And um, uh, so yeah, but yeah, all that was done in in one single day. That's extraordinary. And and, wow. and you know, I can't take full credit for that again. I think the thing that you realize quickly is that what what worked beautifully that day is Suzanne was on point. Mm. Uh-huh. She knew her part. She knew her lines. She knew exactly what she had to do. She was professional. There was no there was no uh, there was no issue. No no need to discuss things forever. She knew right. she knew what she was doing. And so the scenes where where it took time. Don't get me wrong. Sure. Mm-hmm. But but we we were able to to get into it really quickly and and do it properly as quickly as possible. And and wow. same for Pete and same for Mike. It's just surrounding yourself with the right the right actors. Again, it's part of, of the process of well, who can you afford um, on that budget? But again, it's the casting. The casting process was very long. Very tricky finding people who want to be part of that project. They're going to get sure. paid, but they're not going to get right. paid a fortune. Yeah. Um, so it's getting people who believe in it and who are really, yeah. really good at their job. Very mm. challenging material as well for an yeah. actor. I imagine. Yeah. Very challenging material. I mean, as I say, there's so much of the film, so much of the relationship that's built up through very, very subtle insinuations, looks, and you know, moments of quiescence. And, that, mm. and that's that's very hard. That's very hard to capture. I mean, one of the things I keep thinking about in terms of location is the very early on in the movie where um, Susanna's Abigail goes to visit the place. So, I mean, this is, I guess this is a spoiler, but I'm talking about the first five minutes of the movie, so it's not yeah, really a spoiler, but it's yeah. visiting the scene where her father was, her father's body was, was found. Mm-hmm. And that, that, am I right that you, that you shot that, Jonathan? Is that right? I shot that, the entire film, yeah. You shot the whole film, right? Okay, so yeah. do, uh, talk to me about because that it's an incredible location, right? It's a, it's a, it's an amazing. I mean, it feels, it feels like urban gothic, right? It feels haunted yeah. that place, even yeah. if you know, just yeah. and and I think obviously the 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 black and white helps, but I think even you know just the location itself. But I mean, talk to me about like the the, the practical decision making process when you got to the point of script, and then it's like, okay, so. I mean, was that long? Because it's a long shot, isn't it? Where you're, I mean, you you were in front of her with a camera, right? And you're, yeah. So talk to me about like, you know, how does the decision making process work in terms of like choosing the shots on the day and that kind of thing? Well, the the thing is, I already knew that location. I'd, I'd used okay. it before, and uh, I, I don't know if it was one short film or two short films. I can't remember, but I'd used it before. I knew the location. Um, um, and for me, the, the decision making on the shots, it's not really done on the day. I kind of, uh, I kind of do shot lists. I never okay. use them. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. never, I never actually use them, which is really weird. So, <laughs> and, and, and the Andy, when he's going to listen to this, is going to be laughing because, uh, uh, and Sarah probably will be laughing as well because they'll go, well, shot lists that you never use. I, I spend, I spend hours thinking about shots and then I, I turn up on the day and I don't use them. <laughs> but, but for me, the 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 whole thing with that location is that it's 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 all length. Yeah, yeah. And so, in terms of space, it was thinking thinking about how do how do I work on a location that is uh, all length. And so, the decision to film her coming down this location and mm-hmm. and stay on her face was because we also made the decision very early on that Suzanne was so good. Yeah, that yeah. her face was the main point of telling the story and you could argue it's the same with with dean and the same with pete and mike and mm. faces for me um if you have an actor who's, who's that good yeah use use the faces to tell the stories and so staying on the face and coming down the building in terms of the geography and then her face you've got everything there that, that tells you just do a, a backward tracking follow her down mm. um, film a reaction and then adopt a point of view go in it um, and then the other thing that the other thing that we worked on is then working on, on long focal as well to flatten that kind of very long um, um, corridor essentially, so long sure. corridor. Because so what the, was your, the, the, what? the history of the, the the site is that it's a uh, it's it was part of the ammunition factory from World War Two. So, oh, nice. so yeah, yeah. 
what was um, um mechanic so but mechanically as well what were you doing was that handheld was that steady cam what was the uh so we used i used a gimbal for these shots okay okay um so it's a little bit more stable than um than, than handheld. handheld yeah because it felt very so i thought that was handheld man like <laughs> hats off <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a steady that's a steady grip you got there man. i mean i i, I like i I like about the gimbal that it's not entirely perfect in terms of movement, so there's still a little bit of of, of shake here and there, and I, I I don't tend to clean it uh, in post. It depends on the shot, but I don't tend to clean the the little um the little parasite movements that you could get the little bumps and uh, uh-huh. um because I, I like them. I think they they yeah, absolutely in- they yeah. lend sort of texture yeah to the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. But as Kit was saying, like it's such a, an interesting setting for the opening as well, because at that point, of course, we had no idea what kind of film this was going to be. Yeah, and it's yeah. such an evocative setting. Like he's, like Kit said, is this going to be an urban gothic piece? Is it going to have a, a supernatural element to it, or or what? We just you just don't know. And even the the wonderful sort of conversations, the dialogue that happen in that setting are kind of oblique. They're referring to events that the characters know, obviously, but we don't yet. You don't know, not yet. Yeah. I mean, by, by now, I think you suspect because of the opening credits. Mm. Mm. Uh, but this this whole gothic thing, I think, uh, pff, uh, honestly, it's um, with with the the team that we had. Uh, so me with my background in horror, my <laughs> wife with right. all the stuff she produced for me in horror, Todd Rogers who's also big in in horror and then catalinger who is literally just right a specialty is uh, gothic horror michael mckenzie who works for arrow and writes crime novel that are designed right. like like giallo you know oh, wow. uh, there was right. no i think there was no escaping aspects of horror in, in places well, in, in many uh, respects like the essence of the story is gothicism isn't it i mean it, the return of the repressed right it's yeah. hard to avoid that here yeah yeah, I also, and, uh, I also think the barriers between horror and crime are really porous. Anyway, I've always felt. Oh, yeah, I, mean, I agree. Nice. Take genre. I agree. No, I agree. Also, yeah, it's largely for marketing, isn't it? <laughs> 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 but, but, but I mean, th- th- there's a really interesting thing on that for me, anyway, uh, in terms of almost my my subconscious, right? Because you say mm-hmm. it's it's almost like a ghost story, and and I agree to some extent. And before we started shooting, I did uh, I did a podcast with a, another filmmaker called James Plum, and it was uh, it was quite interesting. But we we're talking about the influences of the film, and I, I said stupidly, maybe, but I said, well, you know, if you, he said, oh, what kind of film is it? And I said, well, you imagine if Shane Meadows had directed a revenge movie, and he said, well, mm-hmm. he has. It's called Dead Man's Shoes. And then all of a sudden, I said, well, hang on, why didn't I think of Dead Man's Shoes? And then I realized. Almost instantly, that's because I never thought of Dead Man's Shoes as a as a revenge movie, but for me, it's a ghost movie. Okay. Nice. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I th- so so, you're right. The 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 difference sometimes is very slim, and because of the way we edited it as well, with the little um, flashes of the blurry flashes of of Dean's father figure, I yes. think there is an element of haunting. She is literally haunted. Um, yeah, by, yeah. by what's happened to her yeah and i mean I, again we might might get into this more in part two but like the 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 decisions i think you made regarding when you use monochrome and when you go color i yeah. think also obviously i mean i yeah i the moment i again we'll talk about it in more detail in a second but the the mo for me one of the most genuinely like breathtaking heart-stopping wonderful and kind of terrifying moments in the movie was the moment when the the color drained out of the picture at that specific Mm. because it was Mm. what i loved about it was by then it was very clear to me what the difference was between monochrome Mm. and color like you'd you'd establish Mm -hmm. that on the way through so to to actually reach the pivotal moment when the color drained out of the world was just hard i just i'm just i have so much admiration i mean that did you always know you were going to do that was that always a decision or did that yeah Okay. Yeah, that that came very early on, and um, I mean, probably to understand the decision, we'd need to come back to the fact that it's yeah. inspired by by uh, something that really happened. At least right. okay. the, the murder the murder side of it is something that mm-hmm. happened to um, in my hometown, right. and okay. and what 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 happened was that I it happened I think twenty five years ago or so, maybe a bit more. I, I can't remember exactly, but. Um, it was one of the stories that, because I, I grew up in in what was essentially an, an urban area, but it wasn't 
it was crime, but murder wasn't a uh, sure wasn't the type of crime that was happening very often. At least it wasn't happening often enough that we wouldn't be shocked by a horrendous murder. Yeah. And so this thing happened. Um, story goes that these two guys, um, these two guys, uh, well, actually, this guy, this guy who, who lived on a council estate had finally found a job. And, um, and he, his initial reaction was to, he was so proud of it that he decided to tell all his neighbors that he he'd found this this job that was paying so well after six years of being out of work and he was finally mm-hmm. going to be able to buy a car for his daughter and do this and do that and um, and he went to work abroad and when he came back um these two that lived in the in the same block of flats invited him for a party and um, the plan was to poison his drink and get this pin number from him right and rob him right, sure. and then rob him but the problem is they spiked his drink to the point where he wouldn't wake up <sighs> and so so after that what 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 happened was that uh, they, they they made the decision to start putting put him in the shower in the cold shower mm-hmm. naked and mm-hmm. then beat on him and then and what what there's two aspects of that that fascinated me the first one was i wanted to understand why they didn't leave it to 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 that at the moment they realized that they'd fucked up yeah yeah why why carry on that was always mm. the thing that was weird to me i i, I never understood that it, it was one of those and 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 i mean they left him in a horrendous state the detail of the ear coming off is is real it happened Oof. um spoilers sorry <laughs> it's okay uh, no, <laughs> um, no, no. Uh, and the other thing that fascinated me is that i i realized over a certain amount of time that that my my own family was extremely close to that case oh okay uh, because wow. i went i went to school with one of the two. Oh wow and, oh and wow. he was a lovely guy uh-huh i i literally remember uh-huh. him stepping in uh in front of some some little kid to stop uh, a bully you know we're yeah. talking about wow. this kind of kid and and the other thing that we then realized much later is that my my father, who's now uh, passed, unfortunately, um, was having an affair with their the two's brother. So the third brother, he was having an affair oh, with. Wow! Wow! And so when I realized that, I I started thinking that this guy at that point could have been my own my own dad. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But that yeah. was the first. Oh, I had no idea it was so yeah. close to home. So it was it's close. Yeah. And then That's the second, the, the second step is that I watched I watched a documentary uh, that was filmed about twelve years ago, which was which followed the victim of the victims of the crime, the family, mm. and they they were going back to the the scene of the the where they found his body, and there was still like a little piece of wood in the ground where they found his body and and it was tw- it was 12 years after the fact and these people still hadn't been able to move on with their lives mm, yeah 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 and that to me that's the moment where when i looked at that i thought well this is people whose 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 life has been drained mm-hmm. right of color at a specific moment in time where a decision was made yeah. that shouldn't have been made yeah and that's what I like about the decision. I mean, again, we can probably talk about it in more detail, but but it's it's the fact that you're cho- you're choosing for the pivot point, and it's, for me, it's the it's the emotional intelligence of understanding that the pivot point is not the act; the pivot point is the decision to take the act. Yeah. And I thought that was yeah. just so fucking smart, and I it really well, thank yeah, you. I really like that. So, and it's the kind of thing where you see it. I mean, for I don't know about you, George, but certainly for me, it's one. That was one of the, and there are a few moments like this in the movie where it kind of. I loved it on its own terms, but I also loved it because it was like, it's that, and I'm, I'm going to, I might express this badly, but I think sometimes a sign of a truly brilliant idea is when you hear it, you go, of course, fucking hell. Yes. <laughs> that. Obviously. Right. That's it. But then you think, okay, then why haven't you seen it a million times already smart? Cause you know, and it, and I think it was, that was it for, and it just, cause what it does is it unlocks a whole kind of, I don't want to get too grandiose about this, but it kind of unlocks a whole kind of philosophical point of view actually yeah. it really does and i was like christ this is fucking and i'm just yeah anyway 
I, I mean, I, like, we, we, I liked we, it. <laughs> it was well, good. Thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate that. For me, for me, with, without any pretension, it was this this thing of of saying, well, hang on a minute, you know, what's the cinematic language about black and mm -hmm. white, and what's the cinematic language about color, and and it, and we code it as black and white is the past, and black and white is uh, and color is the present. Sure. Often. Often we code it that way, and and my my thought was, we, but we don't have to code it that way. It's mm. not uh, you code it any way you you want to, um, yeah. and and funnily enough, you know, uh, and I will say that because actually it's starting to worry me because we're taking so much time releasing that film. I'm starting to think people are going to think we stole the idea from Christopher Nolan, and, <laughs> um, and uh, poor things as well. Who they've two, two films have done it the, the same year. Right. We. Ah. You've done it. Not that I'm comparing myself to these these giants, but um, <laughs> but it was it was a complete accident. We we started filming this thing in February, you know. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. But sure. the the concept of the use of black and white and and the use of of color, um, it was it was also coming from a, from a, an idea of of cinematic language and how we invert or recode the use of both color and, and, and black and white and how it works. But for that, well, it, so the important thing is that we needed to have specific points where we would go from color to black and white for people yeah. to understand how we how we, we coded it. Yeah, so to, to communicate the lexicon of the movie, yeah, right? The visual absolutely. lexicon. Yeah, which it does beautifully because you don't, it's one of those things where you don't even, you know, you don't really consciously feel it. You just know mm. because of the context. You just know, you get it. I mean, I, I, for me, what's fascinating about it is picking up on the idea because I, what I what I was, I think, starting to clue into before that, before the transition happened, was for me the monochrome indicated um, it, it clearly indicated trauma and post trauma mm -hmm. and also a, a kind of almost a form of depression, right? And it is, yeah, you it, know, it fed uh, into the gothic themes for me, to be honest, yeah, because absolutely. it's like it's like these people are ghosts right yeah. now because of this one event because they can't move on because they can't grow into the identities they're supposed to be the people they're supposed to be they are now ghosts the world is not real for them anymore i think that's right i think for me there was also there was also a class class dimension to that which we could maybe dig into a bit yeah. as well but i think yeah so that wow yeah which i think was really powerful hard. but but i think for me it was also like, I mean, as someone who, thankfully not for a number of decades now, but as someone who has in the past experienced depression, like, it's a cliche, but it's true. It does feel like the colours drain for the world. It is a kind Absolutely. of... Absolutely. I mean, that's how it feels emotionally. But to, to yeah. find yeah. a way of representing that, and it just made it just made sense to me, kind of instinctively, as you say, yeah. George, almost like, yeah, okay, so that's... But the idea that that's a kind of... Because it is like one of the, one of the things this one of the themes of this movie one of the things this movie is about it's about a few things but one of them is is trauma right and is yeah. about yeah. the way trauma defines and the degree to which trauma defines and 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 uh and it's i mean what i loved as well is that for me it's an exploration of the power we have and don't have in the face of trauma and i think what i love about the movie is the way it's it doesn't uh it it neither it, it neither ignores the the many powerful negative impacts trauma will have on people and the kind of inevitable negative impacts it has nor does it shut the door completely on the notion of some form of if not redemption some form of recovery some form of new life some yeah. form of regrowth from it which i think again it's like most almost all movies will decide it's one or the other right mm -hmm. it'll either be like the kind of especially in a revenge movie typically you know power is reclaimed through extreme violence for an hour and exactly. a half or whatever right. Right? exactly that right and and the smarter ones they might start to hint that maybe actually the quest for revenge you've become a monster yourself dot, dot, dot. i mm -hmm. mean that doesn't happen too often but every now and then you get hints of it but this yeah. idea that what i loved was how much more complex and i think true like psychologically true what derelict seemed to be trying to say or, or, or seemed to be not trying to say that's wrong exploring through yeah, the text exploring i think yeah, yeah. And it's the fact i love the fact i mean again not going too deep into the spoilers but the film consistently with men most of its characters actually refuses to give the audience what they would want <laughs> from their assumptions of like mm. what a revenge film is supposed to be yeah i loved it for that i i, I have a, a real 
real thing for for any kind of media that just does <laughs> says to the audience you know what you might think you know what you want but you don't and even if you do it's not what you need right yeah i'm setting myself up for a beating though on that i think but uh, <laughs> yeah it's uh, i've i've done it again unfortunately but i, I think you just have to 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 try and make something that you yourself would like to see and yeah. one of the things that i want to see is is um is something that i haven't seen before yeah now the problem is you probably won't find that in terms of, of story that much because story you know mm-hmm. we know there there is only so many models of story and but how you tell the story yeah that's a completely different then that becomes a completely different thing and for for us the whole process part of the thing that i've said to myself and to my writers and to my producers and to my crew and to my actors is less genre I was always saying less genre, less genre. Right, let's right. let's let's. Um, one of the scene, particularly that that got rewritten a, a, a very high number of time, was actually the scene, the final scene between Cal and and Abby, which I won't describe yet. Sure. But this scene got rewritten so many times because it always fell too far into the genre. So she would mm. she would it would be a satisfying conclusion, but. But it felt like all of a sudden we had a we had a kind of a badass movie going on, and, and right. the problem is right. Ab- Abigail's journey is one of constantly failing to get what she wants. Yeah, yeah. And then when she finally gets what she wants, maybe <laughs> this felt so hard so many times that she finally realizes that she, it's not actually what she wants. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting. I was thinking about a screenwriter I interviewed a few years ago who said that they. And this is, and by the way, this is someone who screen wrote for for soap operas. So, yeah. um, interestingly, but but he said like the the key to that kind of that particular mode of storytelling was, you create the character, you give them you give them something they want and something they need. Yeah, mm-hmm. and you yeah, have those yeah. two be pulling them in opposite directions. And if you want a happy ending, eventually, what you do is you let them end up with what they need rather than what, rather they, want. Than what they want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But but the way we the way we apply this logic and and this is what the film is two hours by the way which is unusual for a for a indie movie but mm-hmm. but the reason for this is we basically have two full story story yeah. arcs in, yeah, of in one film and we've applied that logic of of needs and wants to every single every character. character as much yeah. as possible. I got yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. And, and they're fact, both was... internally very complex stories as well. I mean, you, you know, you could have had an, like an hour and a half long film that yeah. was just Matt Ewan, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, w- when we were working, you know, uh, and we worked, we worked with where where I worked the hardest is with my actors, and mm-hmm. and the idea was, you know, if 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 Derelict ever became a success and we could we could do whatever we wanted, I would literally do an endless saga of Derelict. So it would be, you know, you would the next film you would explore Cal, right? Who is right. Cal? What what is right. his thing? Yeah. And then Cal meets people on his journey, and then you explore these people, and you'd explore yeah. Uncle Henry. You know, we I want whole, Henry's movie. I was going to say ah, I want Henry's so movie. So there you go. So that so the fucking whole, thing, the, whole wow. the twenty pages we didn't the twenty pages we didn't shoot were a prologue on Uncle Henry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we didn't shoot them because we ran out of money and 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 essentially we already had a film that was two hours and it would have been two and a half if we if we shot the whole thing with uncle henry but the story of if you want the story of uncle henry i'll give you it right I now would love, I, would, I mean well maybe yeah maybe maybe off air would send it over to me or something but i'd love to yeah <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, you were talking earlier about actors and their faces i mean mm-hmm. yeah, again right. you know, so That's sort of yeah. like, I, I love actors that have that kind of like tectonic quality yeah. to their faces and Absolutely. oh yeah totally he so does that is fantastic what a great performance I, 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 do you want to know how i found him yeah <laughs> go, go on so here's here's the twist of fate right i um i was writing one of the drafts and i was literally going getting to the uncle henry scene we had to figure out how abby finally gets a hand on what she's looking for right 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 and I thought we came up with, I think it was Todd's idea to come up with a, an uncle character and it changed quite a bit um, with many rewritings. But essentially, I finished literally typing the last words on the Uncle Henry scene for this draft. And I was like, you know what, that's pretty good. I like that character. And ping, an email popped up. And it was uh, Nick. So introducing himself, I'm an actor, here's my show reel. Uh, I'd love to work with you. Uh, be in touch. And I looked at it and I went, 
just fucking Uncle Henry. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> and so oh. I, I messaged him. I said, well, you know what, dude, I've just written a part for you. Uh, I think it's, it, should, it would be brilliant. Um, yeah. Immediately I contacted him and uh, he, he pretty much said yes instantly. Brilliant. Yes. So a little nice. bit of serendipity going on there. Definitely. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. I love it. I mean, it's it's an interesting thing, isn't it? It's something George, you and I have talked about before because we've done a bit of we've done the odd podcast on movies from time to time, and it is occasionally yeah uh, once once the once odd or twice. Sort of four hour podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, here we are saying this to Jonathan like he hasn't sit and watched just talk <laughs> fucking hours. Yeah, about hell, point, actually, like, what am yeah, I even yeah. saying? You know exactly what we're like. Um, yeah, but I was just thinking about how, like I mean, one of the things that occurred to me that I mean, George, you know, you and I have talked about it before. Like, I mean, any kind of any movie. Actually, any movie getting made is a kind of minor miracle, right? Because there's yes. so many fucking things that can go wrong. It's such yeah. a fantastically complicated process. As we um, mentioned, even when they're finished, right? So many movies yeah, are finished yeah. and then can. They're just not released for whatever yeah. reason. But I mean, I just, yeah. I, I can't. I mean, yeah, I just, I, 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 I struggle to get my head around what the, what the like what the planning process because it must it must have taken an incredible amount of discipline to be like oh, i mean again yeah, obviously you, you described how you're writing to your budget and that's that's yeah. obviously part of the story but then there's also got to be like rolling with the punches right where yeah, like, just like you talk about getting a two-hour delay in the prison or whatever i mean hmm. did you ever hit a point in the making of the movie where you're like holy shit i, I don't think we're going to get this done or oh yeah the, okay. <laughs> every day <laughs> oh really <laughs> okay. did any of it like significantly change jonathan because of any of those problems um the only thing that really didn't didn't get done was the Uncle Henry prologue, and that's literally because we had planned the budget so tight that when we ran into problems or, or expenses that weren't planned, we ended up not being able to to afford it. Um, uh, but other than that, most of most of what's on in the final cut was in the in the script. There's nothing that really changed on the set outside yeah. of the outside of the stuff we knew was going to be improv. Okay, okay. Uh, oh, got but, so there was no like like crisis where you, <laughs> we took a, a different direction uh, or anything think, like that. Let me think. Let me think. Um, no. Th- um, I don't think so. One of <laughs> well, no, the thing is that you're right. It takes discipline to plan something like this, <laughs> and especially if you want to be ambitious, because and not yeah, to yeah, not to yeah, dump yeah, yeah. on it, not to dump on any other indie. But it's you know there are there are type of films that are easier to make than others. Sure. In terms of planning and in terms of ambition, and we wanted to do to do a drama that would genuinely be affecting, where people would buy into the drama, and so <laughs> that meant. That your actors are to be top notch at any point. So, you know, you can yep. get away mm. with with a bit of terrible acting in in a in a in a little horror film. But I think the moment you have a dodgy actor in a dra- in a drama, something like this, in, yeah, it that, would have killed that's, it. That's, it would have killed it because it's so bad. essentially about yeah. the relationships. It's so essentially yeah. about what's happening, yeah. you know, between the characters. It wouldn't yeah. have worked. It just wouldn't have worked. Just one performance, of course, in a a cast this small, you know, it would have mm. just destroyed yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, but but the way that I the way that I you're right about the discipline, but the way that it works for me is that I plan as much as possible so that when it goes wrong and it does, yeah, it's fine. We yeah. we have a plan. There's a plan. Right. The other thing, yeah. the other thing we don't have is that we we're shooting on so little money. We don't have rehearsal time. Of so course. when the, right. when the act when the actors turn up. It's the first time they go into their characters. You know, we're not, wow. we're not, uh, we don't have eight weeks beforehand to go and rehearse. So sometimes they turn up and they go, "All right, so I thought that I would do it this way," and you go, "Well," <laughs> uh, <laughs> mm. or they get it immediately. That happens yeah. also. But but so there's that initial discussion of of how do, how do we do this because we had no rehearsal time. But the way I do it is I actually start shooting immediately. Yeah, we block it. I start shooting and and usually I start with my master shot, so the wide, and then we do the master shot 40 times until we get it right. So that's the one that takes time, but we record it, you know. Mm. And then once this one's done, the close-ups and everything else go actually very quickly because by then the actors know exactly what they're doing, where they need to be for the camera, etc., etc. So you you have to kind of blend, because you're working on such a tight budget, you have to kind of blend rehearsal time with uh your first takes got yeah, yeah. right does that makes oh, sense yeah, yeah so it does rigorous. Really. so it's so rigorous isn't it and so full it's, on. it's intense yeah, yeah. it is intense yeah. 
Um, but then again, but with this kind of film, like that intensity, it does. It kind of bleeds off of the, fin- the finished product. It worked oh, so yeah. so well uh, for it. And you do long hours. You know, mm. you, yeah. you, at first you're quite relaxed, but then you end up getting up at seven in the morning until midnight yeah, every course. day, pretty much. You know, and then you have to pack up the kit and move on, etc. But to answer your question, the only thing that really went wrong was uh, outside of the <laughs> oh no, outside of oh. the drives that died. Oh, oh no! We had we had three different drives incidents. Whoa! Of drives dying on us for absolutely zero reason. Sometimes oh, on the no. camera, sometimes at home when you're transferring the footage, it Is was that, it was nightmarish. Uh, I that, cannot that, imagine the, the feeling of that. that. that I, I feel awful. I just I feel ill just hearing the words. Yeah, me too. Actually, I, oh yeah. my god. Here's, here's, here's the thing, right? So you, I know you should always back up your footage on three different places, mm. but here's what happens. You're working from seven in the morning to 12 nice. uh, at night. And so you come home and you empty, you empty your drives. And the problem is sometimes you don't have time to back them up on the other two drives. So when you come home one night and the drive that has the footage on dies on you, and you, you haven't finished your day yet, you have to come back, come back out and shoot. And we're shooting one of the scenes with Suzanne and... And I had to, I had to go and say, look, I think we've lost some, some of the footage here. Um, and you have to see the faces of your actors because oh. yeah, they've just worked so hard. Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, and so that ended up costing us extra money and uh, and all that stuff. So that that's one thing that went wrong. Eventually, we oh. we, we managed to rescue all the footage. So okay, oh. that was fine. Oh. Uh, but that did cost that did cost us money. But the but you, the yeah the main thing that went wrong was that we we rented the flat. Uh, the, that big flat, Ben's flat, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and I went to scout it, and I, I contacted the people who owned it. And I went to look at it, and it looked beautiful. And it, uh, what it had that I loved, it was it was a massive space that looked yeah. like like it could be someone who has money. But when you looked a little bit closer, it was also very empty and very lonely. Yeah, and actually a little shabby on the edges. Yeah, yeah. and I, I really liked that. But what I didn't account Perfect for, for Ben, is that right? yeah, Ben, yeah, absolutely. What I what I didn't account for was that we were shooting in summer, and all the scenes were night scenes. <laughs> oh God! So you didn't have long. Oh, to shoot. oh no. Okay. Oh, so it's worse than that. So we decided, well, we will shoot them in the day. Okay. Okay, because then we could have 12, 14, 15 hours. Because sure. you pay this flat per day, and then you right. pay all your actors per day, and each day that you have your actors, you have to feed them, and each day that you have your actors, yeah. you have your crew sure. that you have to feed. So sure. all this stuff needs to be accounted for and planned um so we decided to shoot it in the day what we didn't realize is that it was literally there was skylights absolutely everywhere (laughs) Uh, and there was no no access to it so we had to we had to figure out how we would block the light and one of my crew member craig who was my also my first aid he was an absolute legend if he listens to this uh craig i love you uh, he offered to actually climb on the roof, and I said, "No, no way. No. This, this, is, <laughs> this is no good." So we came up all together. We all put our brains uh-huh. together, and we came up with that extraordinary contraption. There is a photo somewhere on on uh, on on Facebook, which is a gathering of bin bags nice. that were all taped together to create that sort of <laughs> giant twelve meters on twenty four meters sheet. That we stuck to the ceiling to block literally every single light. Um, oh my goodness! And in terms of saving money, we also used that location to to keep some of our actors uh, sleeping there. So Dean was one of them, and so poor Dean oh, had the be- the best view in Hereford, but it was constantly blocked with bin bags. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I guess if you rent the place anyway, use it as an Airbnb as well. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Wow. That's amazing. Wow. And we did that several times. We'd rent an Airbnb for our cast, and then we'd, we'd also ask permission to film in it. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. That yeah. Because I was thinking about the house where um, uh, the house where Ewan takes Matt, and then Matt has that incredibly awkward scene with that. Um, Possibly yeah. one of my the... favorite sequences oh, in the so entire good. Ah, well, I'm glad. I love, I love that sequence. Yeah. yeah, I loved it so much. I mean, like Matt was my anchor point in the film. He really was. He was sort of my identity character. Um, so see, that was the point where I, I feel like yeah, hard. It's uh, hard. It's for so me, when, when, when we talk about mirroring, 
of the two characters, mm-hmm. for me, that is that is Matt's sexual assault. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. But it's interesting because yeah. it's a sexual assault kind of by his brother, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it's, by proxy. It's yeah, so fat, by proxy, exactly yeah. that. But I mean, we've also we've already had a kind of very physical sexual assault by him already at that by yeah. that point. Yeah. But absolutely. That yeah yeah very much very much so. I just uh, I mean the, the flat it just really hit me because I've 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 been in places like that you know like I grew up especially when I was you know my kind of sixth form college student era of my life like those were the circles I moved in right because there was yeah, none of us had any money you know what I mean and it like I, I know what that I know what that I know what that flat smells like yeah <laughs> you know I mean? like, right i had a real visceral like oh wow yeah I, yeah uh, yeah so pete's gonna love that because that's his flat <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny <laughs> sorry, Pete. sorry Pete. Um, but, i mean i mean t- to be fair we moved it around and we right. you know we didn't keep yeah. it as it was but we you know we made it so that it, it felt grimy it's not grimy at all actually pete's flat I, yeah but i know exactly more, what it means it's, it's, it's the crap you know yeah. yeah, it's the kind of place where I know what it's like to like collapse yeah, on the you know? And then obviously, once you add once you add the people that live in it, you kind of get an idea of 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 what it what it what it's like. Yeah, in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was extraordinary stuff. Um, I I do want to I would I do want to start to get to the spoiler conversation because I really want to dig in on some of the plot stuff. But before sure. we get there, we haven't talked at all really yet, except in passing about about Suzanne Fulton as Abigail. Yeah. Uh, extraordinary what extraordinary actress incredible performance yeah um yeah. We, yeah we were extremely lucky um with suzanne it was um it was it it was instant yes yeah um because she, she is that, i mean i was gonna say she's a star in the making but it's not even that she is a star right it's gonna happen yeah. i mean you look at her in this movie it's like come on man I mean, I hope she list- She will listen to this, and I hope that she takes it on board because I told her that. Uh, yeah. I told her that at least fifty times on the on the set, and she ended up hating me for it. And I, <laughs> I, 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 I kept asking her how she hadn't made it yet. It was. Yeah. Um, I mean, she she is she is a working actress, so she has right. made it yeah, in yeah, the sense good. that Absolutely. she she works and and she does what she wants to do. But I think I think there is potential there to have someone who is genuinely huge um yeah, the yeah. talent the talent and and you have to imagine the amount the amount of times i mean the amount of times where we planned a scene one way and and then we saw the way she did it and we we're like nah it's just stay stay film her yeah you know, the, it, it sometimes it was very awkward because you, you'd hire you know you'd hire an actor to play a part and then the the scene would 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 start shooting the scene, and I'd be like, nah, there's no need to, you know, the the scene, the first scene in the flat with with the guy that she that she picks up, that she yeah. had the one night stand with. We had all the shots of of him, and but it didn't feel right. What felt right yeah. was just to literally stay on her, um, yeah. her face told the story, and we we found Suzanne uh, on Mandy, I think. Uh, we 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 found her, and I sent her a message, and she responded. And then we opened the, the casting process, I think, and she, it took her a while actually to respond. So we opened the casting process and we had all sorts right. of people come through, some very good, very good people. Right. Uh, and then when she finally responded, she said, I love the script. Uh, I can send you a self-tape. And she sent a self-tape. And Sarah and I looked at it and went, yeah. There she is. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pretty much a thing where you looked at her and you went, there's going to be... There's not going to be a lot of work to do. Yeah, uh, yeah. She's, she's she's perfect for the part. She looks the because I write I uh, oh, we I write always my first drafts and uh, I think also my other script script writers worked on the same logic where we had very specific looks in mind mm-hmm. for for all the characters and so obviously the whole casting process I um, I also share with my my production crew and my writer every time we find someone potential I send it to them and they go yes or they go no uh, and Suzanne it was unanimous there was no yeah. doubt yeah. whatsoever and her only issue was that she was worried about the nudity in the script right and I, I tell this story because that's how good she was okay Mm-hmm. And we looked at we looked at it, and we had a meeting with her. And I said, "Oh, I think we need a meeting with you, Sue." And we had a meeting, and she said, "Right, look, you know, I love the script. I, I think it's great. 
Uh, but yeah, the nudity, I'm not sure. And and I said, well, you know, we can do whatever you're comfortable with. And mm-hmm. she said, well, if we do it tastefully, then maybe maybe I can. And then we thought about it for a while with Sarah, and we thought, you know what? I'd rather have a great actress than the nudity. Right. Yeah. And so we cut all the nudity. Mm-hmm. And in fact, it kind of made sense because, you know, she would cover herself. Essentially, yeah. it opened her on the bed and she was nude. Right. Okay. Uh, and we thought actually for, for the character, it made a lot more sense to not have a nude. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we told her and she said, oh, that yeah, that's great. And then she was a bit, little bit concerned about another scene, the scene with Cal, which we'll discuss sure, in a bit. Sure, sure, sure. So we, we we worked on that, and we told her to bring someone she was comfortable with for the day, etc. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we 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 literally decided to cut the bits that she wasn't comfortable with, just to have her. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. how good she was. Understand that decision. She's fantastic. She's it was absolutely amazing. It was the right decision. It was a yeah. thousand percent she's, right. She's uh, she's incredible. Uh, and she won't like listening to any of this because uh, that's the other thing is somebody with extreme humility and we were all really, really impressed with her, her attitude and her professionalism and, and how far she pushed. There's a scene that was cut. Uh, we didn't. Oh, man, I felt so bad not using the scene. But uh, there's there's a short scene after just after Cal's big um, moment. <laughs> Where yeah. she she was she she barged in public toilet, and she she put soap in her hand and she she basically gagged herself with her own hand with soap to wash her mouth. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And bless her, she was dreading the scene, which I I can totally see why. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, to be nice, we decided to do two things. I decided to shoot it in one shot. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if if she did it right, she wouldn't have to do it more than once. She was an absolute soldier, and because she wasn't happy with the first two times she did it, she did it four times in the end. Christ! Wow. Well and done. The other right. thing we decided to do f- to help her was replace the soap with honey. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Except <laughs> we didn't find out until the very day that she hates honey. Oh no! <laughs> with <a> passion. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah. She was extremely mad at me that day. <laughs> and I can absolutely see why. But she was an absolute trooper. And, and um, yeah, I have nothing but great things to say about, about Suzanne. And I'm, I'm, I'm a very honest person. So if it wasn't the case, I'd probably say it. But uh, no, she was, she was absolutely amazing. And each take, she gave 100%. Each take was absolutely brilliant. Um, and I mean, everything we've talked about the the other actors in this in terms of the the amount of work that they do with their faces, because I think I mean, that was one of the things I, I noticed that as a director, you are clearly, um, you know, you, you clearly enjoy your actors, you know, you yeah. enjoy and you enjoy giving your actors space to do the things that they're good at doing. And you understand the way you, you understand the power of a face filling a screen, yeah. what an actor, what yeah. a good actor can do with that moment. Um, everything we've said about about all the other actors in this, you know, applies to Suzanne in Spades with the work she does with her face. It's just extraordinary, I think. Um, in fact, she's carrying so much of this material. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah you know, That one half of the story, it's incredible, absolutely yeah. incredible. She did really amazing things, and 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 there's plenty of stuff we cut that was absolutely extraordinary. Um, even in terms of of, she was a dancer, I think, Suzanne, and uh, there was a whole scene which we ended up cutting because it made the beginning a little too clunky, mm. where she we followed her at work, and she was with a with a with a customer that she cleans for, and and. Because she's uh, she's such a angry young woman, she ended up licking the food that was in the fridge. Uh, <laughs> so there was this whole thing, and and there was a very very sixties moment where where she kind of puts her feet on the on the the marble counter of the of the the kitchen, and she sits back and she smokes her cigarette like that, nah. and mm-hmm. and uh, and the camera was was going up her leg all the way right. to her face and then the, the she she was smoking and the, the grace of the movement mm-hmm. and the way that the body language uh was screaming rebellion and and punk attitudes yeah yeah that's where that is those moments where where moments where i i i literally simplified the way that i was thinking about s- filming anything to just focus on on this this yes. actress right there right um but in terms of the rest of the cast, I mean, again, the trick is 
you think about budget, but you also think about, uh, we didn't know who we were going to have to play Abigail, but for 50% of the cast, I wrote it with the actors that I wanted in mind. Okay. Yeah. So Matt, sense. Matt, I knew I wanted Mike. Uh, yeah. Ewan, I knew I wanted Pete. Uh, I'd already spoken to Dean about being in a previous production, uh, right. so I knew I wanted him to be to be Ben. Um, we had Corin. I, I knew I wanted Corin to play uh, the the, the mum. Um, right. Yeah. So that that kind of saves you a lot of time, and time is money. Yeah. Right. And also, it makes it makes the whole because the difficulty that I haven't talked about yet a lot is that when you shoot uh, shoot and direct your own film, you have to have uh, your your left brain and your right brain on at the same time to be mm. able to to film it so that the composition and the light is is good but you also don't forget your actors and you don't neglect nice. your actors and your actors yeah. are your priority but at the same time if you have a fantastic performance but the frame looks like absolute trash yeah. then you're wasting that performance right 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 uh and and i say i did the cinematography but i also did the grip because i every camera movement is me you mm -hmm. know <laughs> uh, so uh, it's it's one of those where you have to pay attention to absolutely everything. And one way to make that easier is to pick people that are absolutely great at their job yeah. and are the character. They yeah, are mm -hmm. the character. And and that was it with with Sue. We knew she was great. We knew she was really good. Sure. But we also knew she could be the character. Yeah. And I think it cost her in places. You know, there's days we ended where she was uh, literally exhausted she, you'd yeah. just speak to her and she'd be like look cool we're friends and everything but uh, i just want to go home and have a bath <laughs> yeah. So, yeah totally yeah, i, mean, yeah, I was yeah, going to yeah. ask actually jonathan was it i mean was it difficult for the actors in that respect as well the fact yeah. that they were shooting this material that's so yeah. so dark that has you know goes to such emotionally yeah. extreme oh, yeah. places i think so i know for a fact pete suffered you know, Pete, yeah. Pete ended up, well, Pete ended I, up uh, uh, hating, I, I mean, hating Ewan, yeah. yeah well, I, that, Ewan yeah. must have been such a difficult character to play because he is so irredeemable. And so it, it, it's, it must be difficult to play. The, difficult, like the, difficult, the, ma the main difficulty with Ewan was, wasn't to make him despicable. I think that that's, you know, Pete, Pete could go to dark places, but the difficulty was to keep him, keep him so human. that he could appear likable. Yeah. yeah, there's yeah, yeah. plenty of places where where you could think he is actually quite well. I hope anyway that you could think he's actually quite funny, or that he's quite charismatic, or yeah. that he yeah, could, absolutely could have some redeemable qualities. You know, yeah, um, I, yeah you, you understand why people are, uh, people hang around with him for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah he has that yeah. that that narcissist's charisma, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, 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 persuasive yeah. quality about him. Yeah. I think yeah. for me the key the key scene for 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 you and and Pete's performance in some ways are you and is the scratch card moment. I, I I was like I fucking know you I know mm -hmm. you like it was just ah oh, one uh, and that that was you know that's that's all in the kind of yeah just the way he played that scene out I thought was just extraordinary just yeah because uh, it's it's all there you know like the kind of it is wonderful it, isn't it yeah yeah the the for kind of I, it's, yeah. It's the sequence uh, after that. It's the sequence uh, directly yeah. following that, <laughs> where it's the looks between Ewan and Matt. That's in that sequence where yeah. I can see that Ewan is is thinking, "I know you. I can see something growing in you, and I it needs to be tamped down. It needs to be yeah. got rid of. It's a weed. It's a cancer. It needs to be destroyed." It's crushing him essentially. Yeah. He's crushing that part of him because because he's. he's he, uh, for me, anyway, and I don't expect that everybody is going to read it that way because it's not made clear in the film. But for me, right. anyway, I, I was always it was always this idea of well, if I couldn't live that, yes. then you, yeah. you will not either. No one else is going to. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And I love the like synonymously the the naivety of Matt because you get the impression with Matt that he maybe doesn't even know what his putative identity is. No, yeah. not consciously. Right. Yeah, he's, he hasn't said to himself. Oh, I'm I'm a queer man, or I'm a gay man, or whatever. He hasn't said that to himself. No. And you get but, uh, you get the feeling that maybe he hasn't had friendships this this right this intense before, maybe. Um, and I I I tell you what, again to commend the actors, uh, Mike and Joe, who are good friends in real life. Uh, this whole conversation, which I I I love, I I tempered with the idea of 
cutting it multiple times just for for duration but i can't bring myself to and mm. it's the scene where they're on the on the tracks and they're talking about well what, oh, what would yeah. you do if a train came, came that's so way. lovely and i loved i loved it because I, I came to think of it as as almost uh, a warning of well there is a train coming actually <laughs> <laughs> yeah. coming right, what, what right. are you going to do and the beautiful thing about this is it was entirely improvised by Mike and John right. and that gives you an idea of how well they understood their character and they understood yeah. the story yeah, because essentially they came up with something that that actually ended up being extremely relevant to to yeah. what was happening after yeah. in the story. God, yeah, that's so yeah cool. absolutely. I mean, like, there's there's an entire story unlived there, isn't there? Yeah. An, uh, and your mind automatically goes there when when it's ended by that fundamental betrayal of Matt's silence, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. That that's real for me. That was that was the mo- one of the more heartbreaking moments because you know that they're both done at that point. Also, yeah, like, Matt's destroyed his own life at that point. I also think like the shame of that moment was really powerful to me. I don't, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I don't know anyone who certainly, I don't know anyone who went through the British, you know, secondary comprehensive system who didn't at some point find themselves in some version of Matt shoes in a situation yeah. like that. I don't know. any. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I can, I can recall incidences where, you know, I, I'd see something happening and I have to say, you know, in the moment, my overriding, overriding instinct would mainly be like, well, thank fuck that's not happening to me. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And that, and I think, I think what's brilliant about it is because we are invested in Matt because of Michael's performance is so human, and we yeah. feel. I mean, he had that for me. He had that kind of Thomas Thorogus kind of quality to him for the This yeah. Is England kid. You know, he had some of that yeah, going yeah. on, and I just I mean, it was his own thing. Don't get me wrong, but you know that was that was something that kind of there was a, there was a little echo of that there for me in in a really sort of powerful way. But I felt, you know, I I, I felt what it meant was in that sequence. Um, I, as an audience member, you know, felt kind of confronted and complicit in the moment, you know, Absolutely. in a way, yeah. you know, well, which I think is just oh. something within all of us, isn't it? It's particularly like men who are raised in particular class structures in the UK. Mm. This is the poison of patriarchy, isn't it? This is the filth sure. and the muck and the corruption of patriarchy. Mm. And the fact that we're not allowed to be like what Matt clearly is, he's a fundamentally quiet, sensitive guy. Yeah. But it's not, he's not allowed to be that. Whatever else he might be, whether he whether he identifies right. as gay or queer or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's it's the fact that it, the circumstances, particularly the class into which he's in which he's operating, just won't allow that. It it's also won't the way, allow for that. I mean, you said patriarchy, and of course it is a patriarchal structure, but it's also fascinating that we see explicitly it's also the thread of that comes through the mother. Through the mother, yeah, absolutely. Just, I mean, that is God, so stuck. Again, oh. if we haven't lived that, we yeah. know that family, right? That's right that's Where right. there's one brother who does fucking everything, there's one kid who does fucking everything, yeah. and there's the asshole who's been <laughs> coddled and spoiled, and they allow them everything. They you know, apologize she, for them endlessly. But also that whole thing the mother says to her when she has the scene, you know, she has a scene with, with you and she says, you know, he, Matt, he's not like us. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, she yeah. acknowledges it, right? But then she's I, like, and she, she basically instructs you and like you have to get yeah. him on this literally straight and narrow, right? You I, have to I, drag I, him down into the muck with us, yeah, right? Because yeah, yeah. that's where he belongs, yeah. yeah. We can't allow him to have anything more than this. Yeah. And I absolutely have to credit Kat uh, for for both the aspects that you just mentioned, which is the the, the class aspect, yeah, mm-hmm. and the the mother aspect. Yeah. Both yeah. both yeah. of these in the script, uh, where any version before she had her hands on it, were a little, uh, always a little over the top, and she right. she she brought them right down um, mm-hmm. to to the point of of where it felt real uh i know that be- before she got her hands on it the mom was supposedly an alcoholic and then she she oh, decided okay. that it this felt a little a little too on the nose and so she yeah. we we through a lot of discussion we came up with the idea that she was she was ill yeah, yeah. um and and that that mean that meant that it added a layer of 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 
it's not oh, pathos, it's right? Not really, and, and it's not really her fault either. No, uh, right, we right, felt right. It was a little, we felt it was a little too easy to go. Well, here's the Alki; she doesn't look after her kids. Yeah. Oh, we wanted uh, we yes. wanted her to have an aspect of well, she she is a good mom. She's just doing her best, but the problem is she has no strength whatsoever. Right, she right, right, she right. doesn't mm-hmm. have she she can't. And and the the scene where she looks at them go through the window, she knows something is is not yeah, right, yeah. but she just doesn't have the she doesn't have the the strength, uh, and and yeah, this these were were a lot of of Kat's rewrites, um, and I'm I'm grateful to to Kat for the, the of the work she did. Uh, it was it was brilliant. It added uh, a lot of the time. It added a layer of reality to 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 things that sometimes again came across as a little bit too genreified, a, right. a little bit too much yeah. genre in, some, in certain no, situations. No, it so works. The, the family dynamic so works. It, it's so identifiable. I know families like that. I have known families where that dynamic plays out. That dynamic absolutely plays out. I mean, um, I think the conversations I think between Matt yeah. and his mother, because well, Matt knows too. Yeah. That's the other yeah, thing, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Matt, no, there is a, there is an almost Cassandrine quality to Matt. Yeah. Mm. He knows that his brother is the footstep mm. of doom for them. He knows yeah. that that's the case. He's had this brief spell where his brother's been in prison. It's so, probably like, how the, that relationship flourished in the first place, right? Like it probably couldn't even have happened if you hadn't been put away, right? Exactly. Mm. That, yeah. Exactly that. Well, Matt wouldn't have been allowed to be who he is, right? He exactly. wouldn't have been able to have his own identity at all. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I um, mean, that's the that's the nature of their conversation in the in the kitchen. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, where, where basically, speaks. you know, yeah. you and you and tells him, you know, I, I turn my back for five minutes and right. Yeah, yeah, what happens, right? You don't become like a proxy for me. You become your own person. What's that about? It's just so like Ewan's release puts Matt back in prison, right? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. Right. I feel like we're transitioning to talking about plot and spoilers oh, now. So yeah. are we have to do that. Yeah, um, I'm <laughs> okay with that, Jonathan. Yeah, sure. Right, let's, get into, let's go. Let's, let's so I can get into some shit here. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. So, Christ, where do we start on this one? Um, <laughs> uh, so, spoilers from now on, yeah? Yeah, spoilers. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, guys, spoilers from now on. You know, okay. If you don't mind spoilers, fine. If you do, you know, watch the film first before you listen yeah. to the rest of this, okay? Yeah. So, Jonathan, you and I have talked about this a little bit. I think, I can't remember, George, you might, you might have been in the conversation as well on the chat about, about, Cal in particular, who I think, it, you know, one of the things that you talked about earlier, which I think is really powerful, and it feeds into a lot of what we said is, you, you know, you made a decision that all of these characters had to be, I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but they had to be psychologically real. That was really important to you and the yep. writing team as a whole, right? Uh, and part of the part of the less genre mantra, right, was about grounding this as in a, in as much psychological realism as possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that fair? Yeah, is that fair? I don't want to put words. I in think your mouth. so. Yeah, no, I think so. Cool. Yeah, so, yeah. so what what I found fascinating about Cal was Cal, I think, is probably the nearest thing this movie has to an outright villain character, right? Yeah, yeah. I think he's probably like the nearest you get. And and there were two things I think about that. One was to say, just to say, like parenthetically, that even there, I still feel, unfortunately, that Cal was depressingly psychologically real. Again, I'm I'm afraid I have met people like Cal. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> very very grateful. I don't have many in my life anymore, but but I have met people like Carl. So there's that. Yep. But also, like, in what sense? Talk about if you can. Like, how did you feel about what were the challenges associated with that when you've got a character that irredeemable? And also, by the way, I mean again with spoilers now, in a revenge story, who is going to meet a sticky end, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, for for me at least, uh, and again, uh, so the. the I've, I've realized that I've been to- we've been talking for an hour and a half, and I, I do need to say that whatever I say now, um, um, it's it's what I felt happened. I can't speak really for for what Cat wanted, or what for Sarah wanted, sure. or Todd, or Michael, or I can only talk about my perception of of how things things sure. were. So um, the, the whole the whole idea of Cal it was that in in a structure of of. Uh, in in a, in a story structure that that's supposed to be a, a mirror a mirror image of of two conflicting characters that are essentially going to have going to meet in the end. Uh, it's mm. almost like a like a Claude Lelouch kind of structure where you get <laughs> multiple characters and then they meet in one spot at the end. Uh, it's simplified because there's only 
basically three or four characters. But this whole this whole thing was that we needed someone who would make everyone else in the story feel redeemable. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, at the same time, the trick of of a character like like Cal was that I uh, and I know Cat. I know for a fact that Cat's the same on this. But we we also struggle to reconcile it with our own uh, political views because the problem is writing a character like Cal. You have to be careful that you're not making a generalized statement on on well, working class, class people. Yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. Of course, uh, I, I, I'm working class. Sarah's working class. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dean's working class. Pete's working class, you know, 90% of the people that were on this film are working class. So it was yeah. important we didn't make a statement on on working class. However, it was also important that we were honest. And yeah. you're right. We, so, we, I knew people like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, people that were so unstable and so, um, see, I wouldn't say evil, but I would say that something got so fucked up in their life yeah. that, yeah. that they make it the mission to make everybody else an absolute yeah. misery. Yeah. Uh, and, and if I had my chance and Derelict actually did, did well, Cal would probably be one of those characters that I I would love to to re-explore and maybe maybe explore why he's like that and then what would happen right. uh, you know, if if he, if he survived this sticky end. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, sure, yeah, 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 uh, uh, and and obviously that led us to the to the uh, I would say probably the scene that's going to get me into trouble um, with a lot of people. Uh, which is the scene where so spoilers again okay yeah. the scene where he, he basically sexually assaults Abby yeah. yeah um and and that was see that was um again I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna thank the actor but but Darren was uh, incredible and Suzanne was incredible they were both incredible doing this scene and and we had to get into some dark places with with Darren um and with Abby, Abby, right, as well. And with herself. Abby, yeah. I mean, she's she's yeah. she's spiraling there, isn't she? She's circling the drain. Absolutely, right? absolutely. Yeah. But it's, the key, it's kind of her lowest point, isn't it? It absolutely is, and I wanted it to be that. Uh, and the, the I mean, the, the 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 more cynical reason for Cal's existence was that I was also aware that it was a revenge movie without the revenge. Right, right, right. <laughs> right, right. And, and so at some point, we needed something somewhere that would, that would be satisfying for the yeah. audience. And, right. and we made it as brutal as we possibly could <laughs> yeah. on Cal's uh, fate because yeah. we wanted that moment to be like, ooh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But it also needed to double into a moment of realization for Abby that uh, as her uncle warns her, that going down that path might might not yeah. might not fix anything. That that moment would mm-hmm. be the realization that violence isn't actually going to fix it for her. Yeah. Mm. Um, and both both these guys on both these scenes were absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. Um, well, it's quite amazing, isn't it? Because you have you have the whole situation tied to the fact that you know he he has a dysfunction during that moment, right? Yes. Now. Oh, God, he absolutely yes. can't get it up. <laughs> which I thought was brilliant, by the way. I thought well, that was again. absolutely brilliant because it, it not only, it kind of inverts your expectation of what's going yeah. to happen, which is fantastic. I love that. Yeah. But also it, it kind of ties into this whole thing of it being like a, almost like a, her revenge on patriarchy as a whole, right? It just shows well, you how impotent it, the whole thing really is. I also thought it genuinely was psychologically real. I mean, again, when yeah. you meet those those people who are that kind of aggressive, hyper toxic masculine, you know, every other sentence they're taught they're 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 giving you unasked for anatomical details about yeah. their last sexual encounter or whatever the hell it is, you know, and you're just like, oh my, really? And there is you are you know, compensating for something, right? Exactly. There's that suspicion, mm, isn't mm. there, in the back of your mind, like, dude, really, yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, I it's mean, fantastic. I, I, I know, I know for a, f- I know that we discussed it with Darren, and he came up with with a with a backstory for the character who who was sexually. He thought the character might have been at some point sexually humiliated by his mum. Sure, yeah, um, and that 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 was his 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 drive, but but um, the 
the thing about doing a scene like that, like the, I mean, to describe it a little bit, the, it's a scene where basically uh, Cal tries to force Abby into uh, uh, oral sex. Mm -hmm. And um, when when he finally gets what he wants from her, he can't he can't get it up, and so he makes a decision to to actually hit her instead. Yeah, I, I mean, it's such an interesting scene emotionally, isn't it? Because you know when mm -hmm. Abby starts laughing, you That's start true. laughing. You know, does she start laughing? She kind of does. Yeah. Is that sound? There's a sound yeah, that she like, makes where yeah. it, it's like, you know, and it, you I tell you what, her too. her line delivery of "I'm not laughing" is yeah. one of the greatest fucking line deliveries I've ever heard. Yeah, any because it's just, I I mean I you know I can't I can't pass it. it it's it's almost like a Rorschach reading. Yeah. you know what I mean. Like you bring to it what you want to bring to it. She uh, could be on the edge of terror, or she could be on the edge of l laughter. And yeah, yeah. You, oh, it's fucking brilliant. It's, and, the, and, <laughs> and and the fact that you frame the shot so that we can't see her fucking face, so we don't yeah, know. Yeah. 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 And that, that, that's a decision. Uh, oh. Again, I, I can't take I can't take full credit for this. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I I we basically rehearsed the scene. It was a very difficult scene uh, for both Darren and Suzanne. Uh, and we, we, so on the day, it was pretty much the only scene we had to do. We decided, okay, we're, we're going to do this one and then we'll, we'll work a little bit. But that was the scene we wanted to focus on. Uh, and the first idea was, oh, why don't we do it in one, in one long take? Uh, and Suzanne was like, oh yeah, that sounds, that sounds really good. And Darren was like, yeah. And then w when we were working it, we, I was trying to find a way that, because I have, I have, a, I have a, I have a problem with with a lot of sexual violence depiction in films. Mm, yeah. In in that a problem. I mean, it's not a problem. I'm not going to I'm not going to start a petition, but but what I mean is that <laughs> there's always there's always that kind of that kind of double-edged sword of yeah. f f uh, for the for the wrong people it, there's there are certain Becomes, scenes that could still become slightly enticing. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's and the in, risk. In, of, it's the risk of inadvertent fantasy for film, yeah. right? Some, and right. in in genre fiction, a lot of the time, certainly in genre cinema, when it's aimed at women, yeah, yeah. very often it has that titillating element, doesn't yep. it? Whether yeah. it intends to or not, it's a danger. Uh, and I, I, I wanted that to be a non, a non possibility. I wanted anyone who looked at the scene to go, yeah, well, there's just literally nothing in there that yeah. could be <laughs> exciting in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. And the way that we found to do that was that and again that's that's very brave uh of suzanne in that in that case because usually actors their tool is their face right and we decide we decided with her okay well in that moment he pushes you out of frame and we do not see you again yeah mm -hmm. and we stay on him and we stay on his face and it's uncut yeah. and it doesn't go anywhere and the idea was to create this impression that there's no exit from this there's no issue yeah. from this yeah. Yeah. there's no yeah. There's nowhere to go other than his meltdown. And and the other intent with that was that it's about him. It's never about her in that moment. So right. and that's why that's why I'm asking you whether she, she does laugh or not. Because um in the first in the first people that I showed it to, they said, Oh right. man, it frustrated me so much that we didn't cut to her face at that moment. Right. And and I always responded, yeah. And I wanted that. I wanted. Yeah. Wow. I wanted. Two, I wanted two feelings. I wanted the feeling that the natural, what the camera should naturally do, it doesn't do, and therefore it frustrates you and makes mm. you feel <laughs> like like it's not giving you a way out. Yeah. And the other is that I didn't want to show her face because whether she laughs or doesn't laugh is absolutely yes. irre irrelevant to the yeah. rest wow. of what's happening. Yeah. It's about him. It's yeah, about that's his fantastic. meltdown, yeah. or what's happening in his head at that moment, and there is nothing she could have done any differently to avoid right. to have avoided the, it. The no, resolution. It's about his. It's kind of about his internal narrative about women, isn't yeah. it? Ultimately, yeah, his own absolutely. sexuality. Yeah. Exactly. Um, it's not a sexual act either. Bizarrely, I mean, it, it is, but it's it's an act of dominion, isn't it? It's well, not that, and that, but I mean, and that is what sexual assault and rape is yeah, exactly. almost all the time. Yeah primarily exactly. it's an act of domination and Dominion so and humiliation yeah. yeah absolutely that's that's the kind of you know and it, it it is a form of violence for those reasons and the like, fact I, that he ends up sort of humiliating himself under his own terms <laughs> yeah yeah 
Yeah, sure. But uh, but it was really important for me that we felt that the camera was not doing what it's what we wanted to do, yeah. um, because because I feel like that creates uh, and and I I was almost happy when people told me they were frustrated we we didn't yeah. cut to to yeah. her because that's the idea. I, I, that's I the idea, want, right? That's the point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it kind of it kind of echoes Abigail's own frustration with the revenge narrative, of course. Yeah. Which, of later course. because she she has the same i mean if you'll forgive she has the same blue bald moment really doesn't she because she it's taken away it's taken yeah. away from her circumstances yeah, yeah, take yeah, away yeah. this thing that she's basically kind of sacrificed her life to for the longest time yeah and it forces her to recreate herself she either she either recreates herself or she dies right there's well, no choice climbs, yeah it's, it's recreate itself or climb next to the guy on the bed and blow your brains out I mean, exactly that, that exactly that this is this is the wonderful thing about the mirroring between her and matt matt can't do it matt's yeah. gone too far well, and also, i just think matt's guilt you know that, i mean that's the thing yeah. isn't it matt's just absolutely well, the thing is, the, the, with the murder of of ben i mean I, we're going into the spoilers here but the yeah, murder absolutely. of ben, which of course so, matt yeah. is the one who ultimately commits it and it's really it's shockingly that violent if you don't fucking, see it I, sorry i just parenthetically what a fucking violent. brilliant moment because i didn't yeah, yeah, see it wonderful. coming i did not i see didn't it either it but matt when you think it. about oh, it it makes so much sense because yeah. it's matt once once you and us told matt this story which we don't know whether it's true or not because you know you and being such a an unreliable narrator <laughs> but once you tell him that once he knows that it's almost like matt's exorcising this yeah. putative identity inside of himself right also they look at the mirroring there between matt and cal right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. violence yeah. coming out of the the yeah, yeah, yeah. the sexual repression and dysfunction yeah, you exactly. know yeah yeah just I mean, I mean, I, I, when I read your both your reviews, I, I thank you both for also exposing things that I didn't necessarily think about. Uh, and again, oh. there was multiple hands on this, so I don't know what sure. other people thought about necessarily. Of course. Um, but yeah, the, I, and, and that's the beauty of, I suppose, doing a, a mirror structure is that there are things that start appearing in the reflections that maybe you, you don't necessarily pay attention yes. to. Part of that, for example, was the, the I, I, I was extremely proud of the scene uh, where she goes after Matt uh, in the bar. Love the reason, the, I really wanted to get into this, so I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, go on. But yeah. The reason I was very happy with it is because it is a, it becomes a literal uh, uh, mirror reflection with the, yeah. with the the split diopter where they are they become both in focus at the same time in that moment and they meet each other and the reason I'm talking about this is because there is a, a layer to Matt that I, and I don't know if that came through but uh, I wanted to imply that there was a possibility that in the end he he ended up where where she finds him because he, maybe he wanted for her to not have to do it. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I see that because I mean that scene. What I loved about that scene, and it, it's an incredibly powerful scene. And again, I think I think dialogue free, right? The two actors yes, just look at each other. There's about yep. 25 minutes there where oh, that has no dialogue. Yeah, fucking incredible. But 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 what I loved about it was again, you were talking earlier about no genre, and also we we talked a lot about the way this inverts tropes. We have seen that scene play out a hundred thousand million fucking times, times, and it's yeah. never looked like that. It's never looked like yeah. that. You've never had the bit where the person trying to get revenge just can't fucking do it, yeah. Even though they want to with every fiber of their being, and I've never, ever, ever seen the the person just stand there as if to say, "Yeah, fair enough." I mean, you know, you Matt, he doesn't, you know, I mean, there's there's a there's a there's a quiescence in yeah. Matt in that moment in his face that's just like, okay. Yeah. If, yeah. yeah, all right. I deserve yeah. it. I, it's I, almost I, yeah, it's almost resignation, isn't it? It's almost acceptance, yeah. you know. It's almost. like, well, that I this this was always coming, right? Yeah. yeah. This is maybe yeah. what even even maybe what I want now, because I can't live, I can't be anything other than this now. It's an yeah. interesting thing here too about how the fact that um the fact that and it, it's easy to kind of forget in the in the in the churn of the narrative actually, but of course Ewan fucking kills himself, right? Yeah, mm. you and actually Ewan's guilt is so overwhelming that he fucking tops himself because he can't face Abigail. He can't actually. He literally cannot bring himself to face her. He'd rather take his own life than do it. Yeah. yeah. So, so there is a thing of like. I mean, that's one of the things I found interesting when when Matt was having those conversations with Ewan after Ewan's killed himself. What I mean again, I just God, I fucking love that so much. Um, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I think for me, one of the things that's interesting there was just thinking about the differences in the psychological makeup between between matt and ewan and and once you realize that that 
Matt's the one who actually, I mean, you know, it was Ewan's master plan and he did a lot of vile shit, but Matt's the one who actually delivered the killing blow. And yet yeah. Ewan's the one who kills himself and Matt's the one who, it's like he can't quite bring himself to do that either. Yeah. I, it's really fucking interesting. It's so fascinating, isn't it? Because like Ewan is such a, a dynamic character in so many ways. He's, mm. he, he does, he, he does things. He makes things happen. Matt is, is like a bit of grit in the wind, right? Blown mm. all over the place. He has no real agency of his own, even in his own death. But it's like he's trapped by his own sensitivity, right? I mean, that's what you're talking yeah. about there. That's the thing of that. And, it is that yeah. and it can feel that way. Like if you don't, I mean, you know, if you, if you don't have a capacity for physical violence and you're pushed into situations where physical violence is, is, you know, is a currency or is a necessary mm. precondition or whatever, like self-esteem or you're in danger, if you haven't got that capacity, then you're going to feel that sense of helplessness. You're going to feel that lack of agency. And it's weird how like, I mean, you and if you think about you and killing himself, that's an act of violence ultimately against himself, right? Against He's still himself, being yeah. the action man in that yeah. moment. Again, I think I think that there's a, there's a slight ambiguity there on 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 you and um, because it, it is an act of violence against himself, uh, and at the same time he is taking something away from from Abby and yes. he's taking it away yes. for good. That's a and fair so point. and so yeah. there is there is an aspect of at least for me when I was thinking about how I'm writing it, there's an aspect of it where where. Um, the, like the, the suicide or, almost yeah. feels spiteful towards towards giving justice to someone who's who's seeking it, and that's the moment where she's yeah. uh, making the decision to to take her violence elsewhere. And that, that feels certainly fits that feels with, very Ewan, doesn't it? it does. yeah. This is exactly it, right? With what we've seen of Ewan, I mean, it, you know, armchair psychologist, but there is there is this notion that he is a, a, he's definitely a narcissist. May in fact even be like a psychopath, right, or yeah. bordering on psychopathy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly the kind of thing that psychopaths do. When yeah. they've got nothing else, when the, the only bit of control that they can have, well, that's what they're going to do. The last act of spike to the last act of malice. So that fits. That really scans. I mean, it reminds me, you're saying all that, it reminds me, this is, a, this is a true incident that actually happened to to someone I knew in, when I was in, in college. So this, this is a, she was, I don't know, 17, 18, 19, somewhere around that age. She'd been in a relationship with this guy for a while. They split up and she ended up in a relationship with a, um, with a, with a woman as it happens. Um, and on, I think on the anniversary of their breakup, this guy had been a local music promoter. Like he was fairly well known in the local music scene. He hung himself and right. his last act or, or one of his last acts before he hung himself was to send her a bunch of flowers with nice. a, with a note nice. that read, look at what you made me do. Hmm. Holy fucking hell. Yeah. And it's just Jesus like, Christ. you know, there's some things you can't unlearn and that's like, that, that really happened. That's real people. That's real. Mm. So you just think like for me, what that kind of unlocked was like oh right yeah there really is like a real shallow it can be right a real shallow narcissism to people in that situation where it's just mm -hmm. like it's just a final way of hitting out of the world you know and once again it feeds into this whole commentary on patriarchy that the yeah. uh, the film has going on because it is it is ultimately about men's relationship to women right and how it, it just this yeah, it's a big component. Every, yeah. Right. It's yeah. so cool. I I love that element, whether it was conscious or not. I think it's it's very resonant throughout the film. Uh, yeah. It's, well, yeah, it cert it certainly was conscious. I mean, I, I, I don't know how much of the, the idea of patriarchy I I I personally. <laughs> I, I think I think the, the, huh? <laughs> the whole the whole thing is that I uh, I I think this whole thing of patriarchy though is that it it's it actually ends up victimizing men as as sometimes as oh, much as as women we've, and that's we've, that's we've spoken the, about this yeah. many times it fucks yeah, us all over yeah it fucks yeah. us all over that's absolutely true and again and so, you see this in all the characters you see this in in Matt and so and that, you that, right yeah, exactly so that was that's that was what was really interesting about doing the the mirror thing as well is that yeah. ultimately to spoil the ending when she finds him dead and she has to do basically what is a mental exercise of of imagining what she yeah. wanted to do yeah, to him yeah, and yeah. then and then figure out that she might have been able to reach forgiveness yeah i think the whole the whole idea is that at that moment she realizes that he was he was as much a victim yeah as as she was absolutely uh, yeah i mean that, i think that that's implicit in the film and it yeah it's obvious you know the mirroring aspect of it really draws that wide you know um even Ewan, I mean, even Ewan is a victim of this, right? He would not be as fucked up as he is without. To this. some extent, definitely, the, mm. the 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 social 
the social environment in which he, he yeah. is is evolving is definitely yeah. part of of you know there's this scene that you mentioned with uh with uh, his his friend this is a <laughs> this is another thing is that I, i've i've known people like like um like ty as well played by yeah. ben manning who who yeah. assaults uh, who assaults james i've known people oh. that volatile who oh, will yeah. who were be really best friend yeah, one like... second and then yes. and then yeah, explode yeah. into weird yeah. unjustified violence just because they think it's it's funny for uh yeah um i, I tell you what sorry not to digress too much but that yeah, yeah. scene with Ty, one of the things that i really wanted to pick up on i have i don't think i've ever seen it as well nailed as the the way the way um humor in quotes is used as a fucking shield as a weapon yeah. and a and weapon shield, at the yeah. same time you know what i mean yeah. because it's the excuse oh we're just having a laugh. i mean that's the way that's that guy laugh, yeah, yeah that's the way ty- i was just having a laugh we're just having a laugh mm. and not uh, like and, it, and the and thing maybe is he when he it. says it yeah when he says it you think mm. he you think he probably believes it too right yeah. Mm-hmm. and yet it's it's a it's like a gut crawlingly fucking yeah. tense scene where you're just sitting there identifying with this poor kid and you're yeah. just like, fucking, please make this stop. You know, please. Well, from the please. outside, you know, oh, looking at yeah. it through the screen, you know that that's not true. You know that it's not just a laugh. It may be in his yeah, head, yeah, yeah. but it's, it's expressing all of these incredibly complex, damaged, neurotic things about being a man in these it, circumstances, it, right? It's, it's, post, it's, post-hoc gen- it's post-hoc rationalization. That's what yeah, it is. That's yeah. exactly but it's, it. But right. it's also a preloaded excuse. It's fucking, yeah. and believes it. And he and I, I, you know. I, I, I like the idea that it, it, it eventually. Um, I mean, I, I don't know how much of that is left in the in the final cut, but eventually, when we see James again one last time, it's mm-hmm. it's an image of of now um, uh, normalization in a sense, mm, and yeah. so that we can retrace maybe to that specific incident. Right. And and for me, that was always the idea that when when Matt actually goes to the, the shop and looks at him through the window, the, maybe he does intend to go and talk to him. But when he sees him being like everybody else at that stage, yeah. he remembers that that's that's on him. That's his fault. Yeah, he can't that's his fault. To, right. to that. yeah. yeah, that's what he that's what he took from him. Yeah. 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 It's almost like, yeah, it's I am toxic, right? That's what he's yeah. internalized. This whole world that I'm in is toxic. Everything I touch, it turns to shit. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. Which is a, in and of itself a kind of internalized excuse, isn't it? You know, it gives you license mm. to be weak and to, to not apologize and to not make the effort. It's, well, yeah, also, it's brilliant. Like, also, it's, like, it's, fu- it is, I mean, let's be real about it. Like, and again, that scene with Ty is a great, so like, it's fucking hard to stand up. It's yeah. really fucking hard, yeah. and it's dangerous. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. like yeah. like if Matt does take a step forward in that moment to try and help, oh James yeah, out, he's in like real physical like, proper danger, yeah. right? I mean, like maybe he gets his mate out, but maybe they just both get the shit kicked out of him. Yeah, you know, like it's you know, flip a coin, right? Especially mm-hmm. with a character like Ty, where you just don't fucking know what he's going to do, right? Exactly right. Um. So and yeah, someone who is so sort of meek as Matt actually. <laughs> But you know what I love about that scene as well? Like, it's something that, we, you know, we talk in the abstract a lot about the weight of social pressure, but it's really hard to kind of, it's sometimes it's quite hard to quantify. But then you see a scene like that and it's like, no, this is what it mm. fucking means. It's as real as yeah. a fucking brick. That's the truth. Yeah, that's often real the truth. Of this, yeah. That's often yeah. the truth. Outside of cinema, outside of TV, outside yeah. of fiction, that's more often the truth, I've, right? I've, it is I've, harder I've, to do the right thing. Yeah. I've lived things like that. I've lived yeah. situations like this. You know, I grew up in in fairly difficult neighborhoods, um, my, mm-hmm. my yeah, my entire life. So I have I have seen things like that more times than I can, uh, than I care to remember. Yeah. And and I think any anybody who's working class has has yeah. experienced anything things like like this. Too many examples to maybe be too specific about it yeah, but yeah. I, I i wasn't going to um, it was always the idea that we weren't going to spare any any discomfort and it, yeah. it's a hard scene to watch even even when we shot it they were like oh that's that's pretty awful but but yeah. um again but it, rings there's, true. There's a, it rings true it's sincere and there's yeah. a really interesting interesting example here in that scene of how we degenerify degenerify the, the the screenplay uh, mm-hmm. because in the initial in the initial uh, drafts. Uh, James ended up being beaten up by the entire group, and then they ran away. Right. And and right. it was it was violent, but 
in a sense, it was less impactful. Yeah. Because yeah. it ended up in an explosion of violence, and, and it meant that the film basically exploded here and then yeah. came back down and then exploded again later. Whereas we wanted to keep it so that the humiliation itself would be just unbearable and create that horrible, horrible tension uh, and let you, you know, look, everything is going to be possible now in this in this film. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. Also, I think it's way more powerful for the Ewan Matt story because the fact that Ewan's ultimately the one yeah. who does step in and intervenes. Yes. It yes. shows like some small measure of mercy yeah. or concern for Matt, even if it like and, and again, I love that. I mean, Pete's uh, Pete Bird's like his performance in that moment is immaculate because you can yeah. see the calculation behind his eyes. If I well, absolutely, step in yeah. now, it's a manipulation, Matt's, isn't it? Yeah, oh, hundred percent. Matt's gonna you know, Matt's gonna think I'm still got him on side, he's gonna you know what I mean? And he I uh, fucking hell. Oh, man such yeah. a good scene. <laughs> it is it communicates narcissism the character the script everything about that character and the way he's framed communicates narcissism bordering on psychopathy beautifully yeah absolutely beautifully and and but what i also love is there is all that and then there's also this really really fucked up set of yeah. quote unquote values that are clearly yeah. still there you know what i mean it's clearly yeah. the justification for it and I just, yeah, no, I, uh, God. So. I think I think the key to that was that, uh, you know, we we as much as possible, and it wasn't always possible, but as much as possible, we tried not to judge the characters uh, yes. on yeah, on yeah. on on this, those. Uh, again, it goes back to that logic of if we had the time, if we had infinite time, we could have explored all these characters and given them lives and and see their mm. own set of values and why they are the way they are. Um, yeah. And so we try to to not have not show any mercy or particular compassion for certain moments, and mm -hmm. at the same time not judge the characters on these specific actions alone. Like Ty, Ty, you know, uh, when I spoke to Ben, who, by the way, I mean, Ben Manning, um, I I freaked out uh, when 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 I cast him because. I started having doubts that he could, because Ben is such a lovely guy. <laughs> right, <laughs> he's just such a lovely guy, and he's well spoken, and he is. Uh, Actors are great, though, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, but I really had anxieties about it, and and I had to speak to him multiple times on the phone and say, Ben, look, you know, I don't know if you can pull it off, and it'd be, it'd be like, Jonathan, listen to me. Uh, I'm an actor. I'm a dedicated I actor. Do, I can I can yeah. do this. this what, and I said, yeah, look, Ben, but Ben, you know, you need to be convincing. You know, I, I, and the way the way that we solved that was that Ben said, look, the way that I imagine Ty, I mm -hmm. said, okay, yeah, he said. I'm not going to go with the way you wrote him in the script because in the script it was someone you know, Mr. Sportswear, the the little, oh, yeah. you know, the little annoying twat that hangs around yeah. around McDonald's, right. and we all yeah, know yeah. you want to slap him, but yeah, you know, in the local underpass with their boxing exactly. white lining, that exactly. kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. And Ben said, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to play it like that. The way I'm going to play it is I'm going to play him so that he's, he's, he's that guy, the borderline homeless guy who's hanging around with kids that are 20 years younger than him. Yeah. And he's still, he's still clinging to his, to his kind of youth where he, ha where he had his little gang around him. And yeah. he thinks he's cool, but n nobody thinks he's cool other than, than you and, you know. <laughs> and I said, you know what? Okay, fair yeah. enough. And again, I must command all of these people because most of this the scene was very very clear on what i wanted but we had very little dialogue mm -hmm. the dialogue was right. not written okay uh and oh, and they came right. they came up with it look the the, the scene the scene that you mentioned earlier with eviana which is one of my favorite scene uh, the scene where they go to the flat and then yeah. uh you and forces matt to to have basically a, a sexual relationship that's implied with with a girl mm -hmm. Uh, again, uh, Eviana came on to the cast quite late, and I uh, the initial scene we had was actually completely different. It took place, they went to a nightclub, and there were some girls there, and then uh, Ewan was, was forcing Matt to, 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 to basically have sex with one of the girls. <laughs> but the location of the nightclub cl fell through, and... I thought anyway that it would be more interesting to have something a little more intimate, a little more yeah. real, and mm -hmm. a little, a little, almost more threatening because the guy whose house they go into, who's played by 
a friend of mine who's also a, an extraordinary filmmaker, Tom Rutter, who's last year made yeah. one of the best indie films that I've seen last year. It's absolutely beautiful. You should probably contact him to see it. Okay. Uh, because it's uh, it's completely different from Derelict, but it's, it, it is absolute poetry. It's beautiful. Um, and I thought this guy could play this coke head, you know. Um, yeah. But essentially, so I rewrote the scene for Eviana because Eviana stepped up and said, yeah, I'll do it. Um, and I, I, I basically put a casting call and I, I said, I apologize in advance. This is a very ungrateful part, but I need somebody to play a girl who's going to be kissing um, Mike of all people. Yuck, Mike. <laughs> um, and so she came, she came up and, and because it was Eviana and I, I like Eviana, we worked together before. I thought, well, do you know, uh, we'll, we'll write you an actual a good scene. Mm-hmm. But I didn't want to write dialogue. So that entire scene, there is no dialogue in that scene. And it was, it was a, again, I can't thank my actors enough. It was very uncomfortable for them. Yeah. They had yeah. no safety net. I left them with no safety net. I said, look, it's a sink or swim. You guys, mm-hmm. this is what I want for the scene. You guys make it yours. But mm-hmm. you're going to work it until you get it right. And Eviana at first was like, no, but hang on. There's no dialogue. Uh, yes. What do I say? Well, you know. This is the idea. Let's try, and it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't always super comfortable, but mm. that gave us some some moments that I think were felt and rang true. And there's there's many yeah. in the film where I mean I don't know if you're going to believe this, but almost the entirety of the dialogue in in the murder scene in Dean's flat uh-huh. is uh, ad libbed. Oh, wow. I told wow. Dean and all that. I said, you know what, guys, Dean, what you need to do is waffle and just talk and talk and talk mm-hmm. and talk. And that way we can stretch it to the to breaking point where where, mm. where we all know what's gonna happen to you and we have yeah. we have a character who doesn't want to go through with it, and we have a character who wants to go through with it, and we have a character who doesn't know what's happening, and we make it as likable as possible, and he's funny and he's 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 a lovable, goofy kind of yeah. guy. Uh, and Dean improvised this 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 thing, and it, it was mind blowing. I mean, the, the, yeah. honestly, every time he came up with a line, it was hard not to laugh behind the camera. When he yeah. when he looked at Mike and he said, "Looks like Harry Potter been kicked out of the broom cupboard." It was <laughs> <laughs> he tried so hard not to laugh. He tells an entire story which has been kind of cut around in the in the final cut, but mm. he tells this story. He goes, oh, "You remember?" Yeah. He talked to Pete, and he goes, "Oh, you remember?" Um, when uh, when when uh, I, I, I we were at work and I, I had a poo and uh, you uh, the, it wouldn't flush away and the guy said it's because I was drinking too much Australian lager and <laughs> you came up and I don't know what you did but you, you became some kind of poo hero and you got rid of it and you know and they start laughing and it becomes that hallucinatory moment and that's mm. Dean came up with that on his own. That's you know? right. And for me that was important to work that way in in a lot of instant and sometimes. Mm. That created friction with some of the cast. They weren't always on board with it because it's it's you know you you have to accept that you're going to be naked in front of the camera and that sometimes it's not going to work. Yeah. But yeah, I can't even remember what we were talking about. I went on the tangent. <laughs> no, it's okay. I mean, I did I did want to talk about that sequence a bit anyway because I think it is. I mean, for me, it's a kind of that that section of, of filmmaking, and we talked. I mean, that you know, again, we're into spoilers now. That that sequence contains the moment where we we change from color to monochrome right that has that yeah. moment when yeah you know, the decision gets made basically one of them yeah one of yeah. them yeah 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 one of the yeah and i yeah and and i i think i mean it, 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 what i think i really i really appreciated about that sequence was it was kind of i think for me what was clever about it was there's no <laughs> on the surface of it there's no sense of tension at all because we know how this fucking story is going to end. We already yeah. know we're going to fucking yeah. kill this guy. But because we know that, it actually becomes unbearably tense yeah. and really fucking hard to watch. Well, it? Yeah, it's, it's the bomb completely. under the table, right? It's so fucking good because you're sitting there like, and every like, you just know it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And it really is like, yeah, it's really extraordinary. I think uh, just that. The idea, the idea was that we'd build attention not about not about what, but about how. Oh. Yeah. So it's yeah. like it, it's it like happen? okay, well, we know what's going to happen. 
Mm-hmm. But it's just how, sure. how, how is it going to happen? You know, uh, uh, and, well, it, and it, it was the who? idea, yeah, yeah. Who? That's yeah, where, That's where the surprise comes in for yeah. the, yeah, for the audience. absolutely. That's, it's that, a real shocker, isn't it? But and how it's the, fucking brilliant is that? Like we yeah. think know how this plays out, and suddenly it's of like, oh, wait, what? Like yeah. what? It tells you so much about the characters when it does yeah. happen as well. I I, just, I loved that so much. And it was so shocking. And it, the violence, even though you don't see it, it's so visceral. Ooh. Well, I mean, that's what's clever, isn't it? Because you've seen, we, we've seen glimpses of visceral violence up to that point, And so yeah. the suggestions there in our minds, right? So, yeah. yeah. No, I, oh, oh, yeah. So Again, it was, uh, the, I mean, the vi- for the violence, I, I, I shot a very specific way with, with, with mixing frame rates and, and mm-hmm. um, camera speeds and, and shutter speeds for, for maximum impact. But at the same time, again, going back to, to the idea that it was inspired, inspired by a true story. So it's not a depiction of the true sure. story, but inspired yeah. by a true story. I really didn't want people who had lived this story to 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 stumble upon the film one day and and basically yes. see something that was just horrendously voyeuristic sure and it yeah. had to be shocking and it had to be violent <laughs> but i didn't want to to go into gory territory or no. you know going over the top and actually i think it makes it worse in in some way absolutely oh, no, 100%. I mean, that's combined with the fact that it's matt doing it because that leads you to it leads you down an entire rabbit hole, doesn't it? So you, 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 you want to know why? What, well, what is this? Why, what is this expressing for Matt? It's kind, of, it's kind of a sickness of the soul too, isn't it? Because it's yeah. bad. I mean, the whole thing is awful enough already. And then the fact that it's Matt that delivers the message, oh, yeah. not Matt, oh, mm. God. And the yeah. scene where Ewan talks him into it, by the way, Mm-hmm. Fucking hell! Because the other thing, actually, I wanted to pick up on. We were talking. We were talking earlier about the scene between um, <laughs> between uh, Abigail and um, uh, Cal. Um, mm-hmm. it, it strikes me, and I've, this is oh, literally only just occurred to me, so I might follow my ass halfway through mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> one of my favourite kinds of short horror story is the deal with the devil story. Mm-hmm. And it strikes me that you actually have a couple of moments here that almost mirror deal with the devil stories. Abigail trying to get the gun from Cal is one. Yeah. But also, yeah. actually, I think the scene where Ewan talks Matt into into killing yeah. Ben. Oh yeah. Has there's echoes sort of, of that moment. Doesn't element, yeah, doesn't yeah. It? There's a Faust element going on yeah. there. Yeah, definitely. It's really it, the, the whole. I mean, the 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 theme of damnation, right? Of self damnation. Mm-hmm. It, it's mm-hmm. so there. It's so part and parcel. Yeah, and, and and you're you're absolutely right, and I think that's something we were all conscious of, and uh, th- that's why when when Abigail tells the tells the story to Uncle Henry, mm. the shots the shots of Matt uh, holding the tool that killed her father and wiping the blood on his face is in color, because in her mind it was a right. moment of of gleeful violence, but we've right. seen the truth by then, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in her mind, this isn't the moment that sucked the life out of their lives either. Right. But it is. We've seen that it is. Sure. Mm-hmm. But at that the, at that point in 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 her mind, it it was, she imagines it, in a way that's actually slightly wrong, and that's that's again, mm-hmm. brought into perspective by the color at that at that specific point. And that's so speaks- fascinating, isn't it? Because it's like yeah. she has a narrative in her mind, which is a revenge yeah. thriller narrative. Yeah, and she thinks she almost seems to think that she's living a, a, a sort of revenge thriller arc, right? And at every single turn, she's defeated in that. The beats of the classic revenge thriller actually are inverted all the way through. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's there's another thing I wanted to get into, which is that the you talked earlier, you know, talked earlier about the long shot and the the whole the whole thing about not being able to see her face. Because the the, the other trait, the other payoff for that that sequence is. Obviously, when we do finally see her face post that scene, mm-hmm. it's oh, yeah, that's, like, that's my oh, favorite my shot God. in the. That's my favorite mm-hmm. shot in the film. Uh, as the one I'm most. I mean, I, I full disclosure, right? I I I'm enjoying everything you're saying. I mean, it's it's flattering my ego. Uh, <laughs> you know, I absolutely love this. But full disclosure, I'm now at a point where I've seen this film 172 times, and yes, I, I hate imagine. every single frame. I'm, I'm, I. <laughs> 
<laughs> because it's like it's like look, it's like looking at yourself in the no, in the mirror uh, constantly. I feel, I feel that way about books I've written. I know exactly yeah. what you mean. And I'm not someone. Yeah. I'm I'm not someone who loves themselves all, all that much anyway. So <laughs> looking at my own work all all the time is kind of a, a difficult exercise. Yeah. But uh, the reason I said that is because I, I, that shot when I see it, I am. The shot of her walking on the road with yeah. the cars behind and she's trying to light that cigarette and her face is all battered is, is yeah. a shot that I, I'm very, very proud of. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's fucking brilliant. And and the other thing I love is that you then get that kind of, I don't know if it was, I don't know if it was a nod to Chinatown or just a nod to realism, but the fact that she spends most of the rest of the movie yeah. with Rai coming yeah. out, it's just, yes. Because one of the, one of my bugbears, in, in one of my many bugbears with revenge movies, and by the way, I love revenge movies, even trashy ones, I love. <laughs> I know they're bad, but I love them anyway. But it, it, one of my bugbears in that, and, and in violent kind of, you know, action movies in general, is just the way people shrug off injury. And again, yeah. I think that's one of the not genre things you do very explicitly. The fact that she spends the rest of the movie with that eye, you know, covered up or, or a lot of the rest of the movie with that eye covered up. I think it's really, I just appreciated it. You know, it was like, yeah, yeah. you get hurt. You yeah. fucking stay hurt for a while. Violence it. means something in this, yeah. doesn't it? It yeah. actually has weight. It has yeah. real life weight. That, that, that's exactly right. And, and But also then there there is also some some genuine, uh, I mean, it's, it's a layered decision that, that essentially to, to put a bandage on her face and, and uh, 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 there's multiple reasons why we decided to go for that. The first is that we wanted a, a form of externalization of uh, internal pain. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing. The second thing is that when you work on a budget, wasting two hours every morning to do In full makeup, makeup of course. <laughs> of course. becomes a huge yes. problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And the third thing is, I wanted an, at some point, that's, even though her revenge keeps failing, I did want her to look iconic. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To some extent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's that whole idea of, uh, you know, thriller and, uh, yeah, that's right, Chinatown and, mm. you know. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was, so that, was the, that was the reason for that. And obviously, Suzanne hated that. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because she had to spend long shooting days with all this crap on her yeah, face. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course. So um, I want to talk about I want to talk about the scene that follows that as well. The the moment with her neighbor. Yeah, because I think that is one of those. It's what I love about that scene is it's one of those moments that on the surface on it, like on the most surface level, an immediate glance might feel superfluous. But for me, was really fucking important. Like I, I needed that scene in the movie and I, I, mm -hmm. because there's so much in the film about alienation, right? A lot of what's yeah, going yeah. on, you know, and, and for me, that scene and that moment of connection and that reminder of, because it, you know, you were talking earlier about some of the, some of the concerns you had as writers about that tension, right? Between mm -hmm. I want to accurately portray just how fucking horrible it can be at this end of the economic ladder and just how horrible some people can be. And yeah. I don't want to be presenting like a blanket demonization of the working class for the top yeah. to look at and say, see the mm, animals, right? This scene was so fucking important because it was as psychologically real as any of the other scenes. Mm -hmm. And, and just the glimpse it offered of hope of humanity. Yeah, yeah. Of, it's, it's, oh, it's, so the it's, it's the moment that, that while she, she isn't fully transformed, she, yeah. she's put on 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 a path that might lead her to to something a little yeah. more positive eventually yeah. um and um that was that was always the thing the way that i described it to to sue and how we defined the character is i said she's she's a good-hearted character who's basically on the wrong path and she can't yeah. see she's just on the wrong path yeah that's all it is um and if she could find a way to 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 put to take one step towards the right direction, then she would eventually be fine. Yeah. Um, and and her moment with Clive is the moment she realizes she doesn't actually have to necessarily be alone, and yeah. there are people out yeah. there who don't mean her harm. Because yeah. I yeah. think this is the other thing, is we were talking about trauma and, and Abigail as a character and all that, but they, what they take away from her is, of course, they take her father, but they also take her faith in humanity. Yeah, yeah that's right. right. She, right. 
<laughs> she's, really on a destru- yeah. she's on a path of self-destruction, isn't she? Ultimately, yeah. it's that that's what the revenge path is in reality, isn't it? Ultimately, she can't yeah. see anything beyond it. What is she going to do? Like after if, if she succeeds, if she kills Matt, what is she going to do after the only thing is self-destruct? Right. Yeah. yeah. That's it. There's nothing else left for her. Yeah. But, uh, I love the idea that the trauma has broken her kind of psychological contract with humanity, right? I mean, that's almost what yeah, it feels yeah. like. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's right. And that's, yeah, and, that, yeah, and, that, and that's and, and that's with her own pers- future, right? With any yeah. notion of of self that she has, she she sacrifices everything to this one thing. Yeah, which is it, she she is stuck, and and this this whole idea of mirror image is that when she turns up in that room and he's dead, it yeah. it robs it robs her once again of of her agency. But yeah. at the same time, it gives us something else. Is that it gives her the realization that that's what self destruction looks like. Yeah. And yeah. so she has to find another way at that at that stage, and it becomes it has to become because it can't be physical anymore unless she starts <laughs> destroying the body. Or, or so it has to be. It has to become a a, a mental solution. Yeah. She has to make peace mentally with her own sense of moral, her own sense of duty, her own sense of want, and her, uh, her own sense of need. And she she has to find a way, and the way that she does that is to recreate her her revenge in her own mind and, and actually come to a conclusion that forgiveness is maybe the best form of revenge. Because yeah. I, I think what, what interested me is that if you take it in terms of pure images, she does save Matt in the end. Right, right, right. He's, he's dead in reality, but in her yeah. mind, she she set him free, and then she she puts him into fetal position, and 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 mm-hmm. she she puts him at rest, and she she puts him at peace. She puts the music back on uh, yeah. that 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 haunted him, and uh, and she leaves him be. I mean, she does all that at the same time. Prior to that, you know, the the necessary precondition of that is she also reclaims her own power, and yeah, she yeah. does put him in fear for his life. Yes. and then she 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 demonstrates for him the better path. I think that that's is, right. yeah, that's I right. think that's really powerful because yeah. you do need both sides. You need that as it, well. It, I, it's yeah. this idea. It's this idea that in order to be able to forgive, you need to be in a position where you would have the opportunity to not forgive. Right. Right, I think right. it's, it's because yeah. forgiving, forgiving when you have no other choice is, is kind of it is not forgiveness, right? It's uh, not when, forgiveness, when, yeah. when you have someone at the end of a gun and you decide to forgive them, then it has then it has weight. Right. And so yeah. from there, from there, the whole the whole journey, because we kind of took it in reverse in that sense. We were like, well, what's mm. a quest? What is a quest? Right. And mm-hmm. so when she when she is unable to to kill Matt with a knife in the bar, rather than blame her own inability to do it she thinks well it's the knife i can't do it with a knife this is right. that that, mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. that idea that a gun kind of is it, it takes away the responsibility you press a button and and it just kills but it 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 right. doesn't feel like you're stabbing yeah, yeah, yeah. so it was kind of um making those objects that she is um she's questing for projection of her of her desire so she's got she's yeah. at first she's got a desire for a knife she can't do it with the knife so she she throws it away and then the desire gets projected onto onto an obsession for a gun because she thinks it's going to give her the power but eventually so, she yeah. realizes that her power is is elsewhere you know mm. her power is yeah, in so to it's, forgive it's a diversion ultimately isn't it from yeah. what the, the the journey she has to take yeah the i mean the intro the interesting thing about that as well is that if you think about that in that context, the scene with the knife is actually, it's almost her, it's almost a moment where her conscience is trying to assert itself. It's almost like she's yeah. trying to hear her own lesson in that moment, mm-hmm. but she can't yeah. because she's so committed to the path um, that she can't hear the lesson her own body mm-hmm. is giving her in that moment, right? The refusal she, to, yeah. She ultimately does what, what uh, Matt can't do, which is forgive. And yeah. the idea is that Matt needed to forgive himself. Um, right. And he couldn't and, do that and, either. And he couldn't. No. Yeah. And so Abigail. So this is where I think this is where for me where I, where I'm pleased with what we did in terms of writing is that it becomes quite it becomes quite. I mean uh, that sounds quite pretentious, but I don't mean it like that. But it becomes quite complex in in the end, in a sense. Um, yeah. I remember showing it to to the early edits to people, and they were saying, "Well, what I really love about this is how simple the plot actually is, but it becomes extremely kind of complex morally." Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, yeah. And in the end, she forgives him, and by doing so, she sets him free. But also, he's kind of dead, and she has to forgive herself. 
And mm-hmm. the way to do that is to take a step towards people that she has neglected uh, because of, of mm-hmm. her obsession with with revenge. Uh, and yeah, Matt could not forgive himself, and therefore he is what Abby would have been if she had been able to to fulfill her her initial desire. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I mean, in the end, ultimately, Matt's sin, I suppose, becomes manifold, doesn't it? The murder becomes manifold. He doesn't just murder Ben; he murders his own future. Yeah. He murders yeah. all of the the identities that he could be, and she's almost there too, right? I mean, she it, almost gets to that place. Yeah, and I think I think as well when it comes to you know when it comes to Matt's story, I think the significant that's why I think it's so the significance that he's visited by the ghost of Ewan is so important. Yeah. Even though, I mean when I say that, I I I mean my read of it is that it's Matt's mental projection of the ghost. I yes, don't mean it's yeah, ghost, yeah. but but it felt like that to him, and I and I mm-hmm. think that scene is just so. I mean, it's such a powerful scene. Huge because credit, is like, huge yeah, credit on, on this scene to Michael and Kat, both of them. Uh, I think Michael came up with the idea that he was dead, that right. uh, Ewan was dead, because yeah. I think in the initial script, he was um, he was still in prison. Right. And he felt right. he felt it would be more powerful if he was dead and visiting his, mm. his brother. Yeah, and then, uh, so. And then Kat... Huge credit to her because she basically condensed two different scenes. Uh, we we saw Matt being visited by Ewan, and then we saw Matt v- being visited by Ben. And she thought, "Now nah, this this gets a bit too repetitive, and it's it's more powerful if it's Ewan alone." Yeah. And she compended both scenes into one, essentially. Ah, uh, it's so good. Yeah. Brilliant. It's just Brilliant. A great Sorry, good I, decision. I good decision. It works. No, it's okay. It really works. Yeah. Um, the I I I feel like we <laughs> we've been going for two and a half hours. I'm sure we're going to stop at some point. I do before we before we wrap up. I do want to talk. Now we're talking spoilers. I do want to go back to Uncle Henry. Yeah. Um, brief, mm-hmm. if that's okay, because I think one of the I just love that sequence because I felt for me. I mean, we've talked a lot about how good the actors are, but I loved how for me there was so much weight behind everything that that nick cornwall said as henry and i yeah. always felt like there were there were really deep waters between these two characters that we only got mm. we got we got a feeling for but we didn't get all the detail of and i i love that right. feeling as a as an audience member when you see a relationship and it just feels like holy shit these people have known each other forever and there's a yeah. real history here and they've got the short tickles, hand with each other. Uh, oh, it's so it good. tickles the writer's craw, doesn't it? You know, yeah, you, you start to imagine the backstory. You start yeah, to think, well, exactly. what has gone on between them? What <laughs> yeah, can we yeah. extrapolate each from each I mean, I, I'm glad you mentioned it because that was that was both the most painful of all the processes we we've, we've had was building this scene. And right. in terms of, of the writing, it's where we sacrificed such a huge chunk. And uh, we didn't want to because it was absolutely, it was honestly, that prologue was stunning. Sarah, my my producer and wife, wrote it. And right. it, was, it was, oh, man. And I'll talk about it because I it's never going to get made, <laughs> so I want to explain. And essentially, that whole prologue, we had, to, we had to somehow, we ended up in a situation where we had no past for Henry. Right. And so we we thought, okay, well, how do we communicate this past for Henry? And I ended up shooting a little insert in my own kitchen of of photos of him in the army, and then uh, dog tags basically hanging from his um, from his kitchen cupboards, um, mm-hmm. and that replaced an entire storyline for for Henry. Right. But the 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 painful thing with that scene is it's a scene we we rewrote. I don't know how many times, honestly. It mm. was one of those we just couldn't get right. And we yeah. ended up on, on on the set and it still wasn't quite right. And and Nick, I think Nick was aware of it and mm. Suzanne was aware of it and I was aware of it. And so I said, look, what we're going to do is um, we're going to actually shoot it slightly differently. And we, we basically spliced the scene in two and we did the first half outside. And then I mm. said, and then mm. we'll move. We'll move the second half of the scene inside. And he puts the ball down, and the conversation continues as if as if nothing had had stopped. Right. But the key was that I wanted I wanted it to, the the whatever we did with this scene always sounded a little bit too much like a like a like a genre piece. Right. You know? The moral uncle who, who sets you on the right path. Right, God, you're almost like the sage character, right? So what, I mean, it's, it's also so what kind of refusal did, of the call almost. But yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What, what we did is I put the camera uh, in a corner and I, I, I said, okay, look, we're going to do a wide. You guys 
are just going to ignore the script and you're going to argue. <laughs> you, Abby, you want a gun. You yep. don't want to give it to her. Yeah. And I think Nick <laughs> Nick got into it so so beautifully with with Sue because he was he, he kept saying to her, "Okay, you need to really give it to me so that I can I can so that it can go up, it can escalate, we can right. we can." And so we spent an entire Monday doing that one wide shot uh, until we got it right. And I, I said, "Okay, we call it a day, and we come back tomorrow, and we do it to that level, and we'll shoot it, we'll shoot the close ups, and we'll shoot the wide, and we we'll shoot all this." Mm-hmm. But now we know what we're doing. You've you've created this scene. You're arguing. This is it's an, a family argument. It's it's mm-hmm. messy. Yeah, yeah. You're, gonna talk on, you're gonna talk on top of each other. You're gonna yeah. you're gonna you know it it needs to be emotional. It needs to be. It needs to it needs to feel like you care for her and she's on she's you just want to wake her up snap her out mm-hmm. of it and they got into it and and we had hours of footage of them screaming at each other <laughs> <laughs> honestly yeah. uh, was, uh, uh, and there was of course a beautiful moment that uh, um we we shot this this line where she goes do you understand what i'm here to ask you for and we are filming this super dramatic uh, tracking shot on 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 Nick's face, and he's about to say, "You better come in then." And uh, so Suzanne delivers a line, and she goes, "Do you understand what I'm here to ask you for?" And the camera is moving towards Nick, and he's got this intense look. And then all of a sudden, a sheep goes, "Meh," <laughs> 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 and it just couldn't help but 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 laugh. Yeah, uh, it was it was one of those moments that was just. But yeah, this whole backstory for Henry that that Sarah wrote, it was just such a beautifully designed prologue where we basically met Henry and he's he's, he's this old disheveled guy and he's he, and it was it what was beautiful about it is that it reflected on on other things in the story um, and it felt it felt disconnected when you would watch the film and I wanted that I wanted people to go. What's this about? What's Until this about? Yeah, yeah. you reach Uncle Henry, and he would get in the car, and and while while looking in the in the in the back mirror, it uh, it sees some some young guy in a in a in a army uniform, right, talking to him and and uh, saying, you know, you sure you want to do this? And he goes, yeah, well, I have to. And he drives for, across the countryside, and he goes to this farmhouse, and there's a the woman there, and uh, turns out that she's she's the wife of of someone who died under his command right okay and it doesn't happen the way that he that he wants to and she's very unforgiving of him and so he decides to go to a to a pub and and get drunk and whilst he's there there's a bunch of lads who are a bit noisy and there's a parade on the tv and he, he doesn't take kindly to it and so he gets into a fight with them and basically gets bitten beaten to 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 a, to an inch of his life and mm. so he, he heads back to the to the farmhouse and she finds him in the morning and she looks at him, and he looks at her, and 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 a tear a tear comes out of of him, and she looks down at him, and she just puts his his hands on his uh, her hands on on his face, right. and that was the end of the prologue. Mm. So we mm. had this whole thing, and then we'd get into the film as it is now. Um, yeah, right. Wow. And it would have been it would have been it would have been beautiful. Um, mm. yeah, would, yeah. There was a risk that that people would have gone. I have no idea what this is about for for sure. a good for a good hour and a half of the film after that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it would have eventually made sense and, and the the operation of, of the ghost that was haunting Henry would have also reflected on you and haunting right, Matt right, and therefore right. on right, Ben right. haunting Abby and so it all kind of connected right, that yeah. way. And that's why the line I've been down this road, Abby, trust me you don't want to go there has been left in the film it's because he's actually mm. been down this this exact same road she, yes. she when when vicky the woman found him is in his car in the exact same state that he finds abigail in right right, right yeah right, yeah. right. Yeah. so it, it all worked that way um but it, i mean i i understand what you're saying and it's i mean having heard all that i would i would love to see <laughs> i would love to see that because i can see it's like but the movie works like it really yeah it does works. it really does it yeah it, without that it actually focuses it more on abigail yeah, and that, yeah. that particular yeah. narrative you and know if you can if you can guess it then sometimes yeah. it's not there's, necessary there's, to there expose it yeah, yeah there is something in the in the, the one scene where he appears you know yeah. that it, you can you get the dynamic 
you understand the, what's going on there. The, the delivery of that line was just fucking flawless as well. I mean, it, it, it resonated yeah. so strongly. Again, <laughs> Nick Nick was 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 beautiful. Yeah, yeah. you know, I um, yeah. he was he was perfect for the for the role. Uh, I yeah. can't stress it enough. I mean, my entire cast. I'm so. Uh, I need to say this because some of them will probably listen to it. And if if I haven't. If I haven't mentioned if I haven't mentioned you by name and you're listening to this, I I am also grateful to you. It's just it's just an extensive cast. Yeah. Uh, oh and my it's, god. It's and easy to focus on on the lead and uh, sure. on on yeah, Suzanne and Mike and Pete and Darren and Dean and but Nick did an extraordinary job and yeah. Corin did an extraordinary job and yeah. Ben Manning did an, an an incredible job and Joe Nurse as well is 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 fantastic. He plays James and he's he's mm. great. Yeah. yeah I, great. I've, I'm and Stacy Stacy Coleman who plays Rose was also mm. so Rose. So great. Yeah. yeah. Um, Everybody, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to them because this film rested entirely on how convincing these people in a thirty-five thousand pound movie could yeah. be. Yeah. <laughs> because the moment we had a a, a a bum note on the acting, that's the end yeah. of the drama, you know. Well, well this I, is it. Uh, I mean, you know, as, you an, it. as audience members, my yeah. God, I mean, yeah. there, there is, guys, you you're in a beautiful film. You've made an an yeah, extraordinary. 100%. Phil. Yeah, I mean, I just, I mean, I really, I do, I, I can't remember if I said it in the review or not. I meant to if I didn't, but I, I mean, I just really hope, I genuinely hope everyone involved, yourself included, obviously, I really hope they feel proud of what, what they've achieved yeah. collectively, what you've well, achieved. They, they, oh, they haven't it's... seen it yet. Oh, really? They oh, wow. Yet, so the first time they're going to see it is going to be on the 17th of March. Oh, mm. wow. That's yeah. so exciting, man. Yeah, and yeah, I, uh, honestly, uh, Jonathan, thank you for letting us watch it. Yeah. Oh no, you know, you know, what? I feel no, so privileged no, to have no, 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 given no, access it, to this. It, here's, here's the thing, right? With tiny films like that, then we we are feeling it already now. Is that it's very difficult to generate interest, and uh, anything that can help with that is 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 you know reviews and and podcasts and interviews and stuff like it that. Is. You know, Sincerely, I mean, the, our pleasure, Kit. Right? God, yeah, ultimately, ultimately, the thing is. Convincing people that a thirty-five thousand pounds film is worth watching is is these days extremely complicated. No, of course, uh, yeah. of course, you know. I mean, no, I, you it's know, an I mean, we, film. you know, we and we both. I mean, we both said it at the start, but you know, like, it, I mean, I, I. I believe you when you say it's a thirty-five thousand pound, but I can't get my head around it. I, just I can't, can't get, but I cannot. I cannot square that. I cannot no. like there's something in my mind that just fizzles and goes. It's just it is a work of extraordinary quality. It really yeah. is, and I, yeah. you know, I'm, 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 I feel very grateful to have been given the opportunity to see it this early, and I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just thrilled. It, you know, I mean, uh, it probably again, it probably came across in the view, but like, I'm, uh, like. I'm excited to tell people about this fucking yeah, movie. Yeah, absolutely. Like, it's well, like, do you because I, when you, I didn't know. I didn't when know we watched did. it, Kit, yeah. and we were, we were WhatsApping one another, and I think I think we yeah. put something like, I can't remember who, who, who texted who first, but it was something along the lines of just watch Derelict, wow. Yeah. You know, it was just <laughs> yeah. like, just breathless for a while, yeah. for a long while, right? That was really nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I just, yeah, I, I, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, it, I don't want to get too kind of, uh, you know, overblown or sentimental about this, but like, it's genuinely like for me, the best, one of the best responses I can get from art, whether it's a movie or a novel or whatever, it, it felt to me simultaneously to be, I felt a sense of, I felt a sense of joy that it was, that it was possible, you know, that, that a movie like yeah. this was possible to be made on that kind of money look this fucking good and be this oh, fucking so good that's, that's just right, like yeah. come on man like that and, and simultaneously in the best possible way a sense of challenge you know mm. like as a as a writer looking at it and going okay mate so you think you're digging deep well this is what digging deep looks like well i i, I, I don't know i don't know about that i mean we we, we i can say we, we did we did our best um that i can say with confidence now you know i can't say about my own my own film that i think it's amazing and, and all that stuff <laughs> but, but what, uh, what i can say is that we all of us everyone involved did their absolute absolute best with very very little and mm -hmm. that and that shines you know, through and i think i don't know what you're saying really you were saying about like you've seen it like i like you're getting on for 200 viewings and and i imagine like when like i've read my debut novel like a similar number of yeah. times all i all i see are the flaws 
All yeah. I see mm-hmm. is every oh, yeah, single yeah. thing in it where I'm just like, And there oh, comes God, a really point, I mean, I do don't it. know if it's the same um, in film, Jonathan, but like, after you've read like a manuscript like over a hundred times, you get blind yeah. to it, don't you? You, oh, can't, yeah, you can't actually see it, you know? I, I, I am, and I am completely blind to it now. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is the thing is that I, I look at it and, and I'm like, oh, God, you know, and, and yeah. oh, I mean, I, objectively i know that this is this is something that's necessary in order to to do better each time and sure. for me the best thing is anybody that's seen the rest of my filmography and that has seen derelict has said this is easily easy the best thing you've you've mm-hmm. done and that pleases me mm-hmm. but at the yeah. same time at the same time i'm 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 i have to be hypercritical and i've seen it too. i have to be hypercritical anyway and yeah. having seen it 200 times on top of that is, is, is it makes it extremely okay. difficult, especially, you know, everything becomes a reflection of yourself. So it's like looking sure. at yourself in the mirror all the time. Yeah. It's <laughs> extremely, yeah. extremely tiring. And there's also the fact that I'm, I'm at, at heart, I'm a, I'm someone who just loves films. And so right. I have this idea of where I want to be and what I want to do, you know, and then, mm-hmm. and you can't help it. You compare yourself to people you shouldn't probably compare yourself to. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it's, it, you know, it's a painful experience. You go, well, you know, this shot inspired by, uh, I don't know, Martin mm-hmm. Scorsese. I wish it was more Martin Scorsese, you know. Um, <laughs> but this is, uh, this is it. This is, this is, this is it. Uh, yeah. But I think it's healthy. Yeah, I, 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 I don't have a lot of time for people who like to, to lick their own balls in public. It's kind of a weird, <laughs> kind of a weird thing. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, but I but think no, you're right no, as well. No. I think it's all part of the drive, right? I mean, we. All, I mean, I, it's funny. I was talking to. I, I do. I mean, you're, you're going to be coming on Rightopolis, aren't you, later in the in the year? Um, and and we'll be talking to you more. You know, we'll, we'll focus then on the writing side of it in a mm. bit more detail as well. But like, you know, R. J. Barker, who's one of the who's one of the kind of co-hosts of that, who's a you know very accomplished uh, fantasy author. You know, series of trilogies that have sold very well, and mm. you know, mm. won awards. And he's a he's a fucking brilliant writer. But he, he, we've said, he said on that show several times, he, he's always frustrated at the slightly better writer that he knows he could be in a few years. You know, he's always, he's always like reaching over the horizon for that better writer that he's not quite managed to be yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think that's true. I think that, I think you're right that that is, I do think that's healthy. I agree with you. I think that's a healthy way to be as a creative. You should always be restless for the, you know, wanting to, wanting to push it. But I think, I mean, I think, I think, I, I hope you find some moments of celebration here as well. Oh know. yeah, yeah, Absolutely. no, of course, yeah. the, especially the, in like in our reaction, you know, as, as, yeah, as audience course. members, of course, like, and, it, it and, just... and uh, I want, I want to believe you as well. When, when, when you know, when you say all these good things, that I really want to believe them, and and of course, there are moments, <laughs> there are moments in the film where I, 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 I've achieved exactly what I wanted to achieve, sure. and I'm, I'm sure. happy with it. I'm happy with the light, or I'm happy with a certain a certain shot or with the way that I made people look or, you know, there's plenty, there's plenty of moments where I'm, I'm happy, but, but it's, it's also that endless tinkering. I'm, I'm, I'm very sure. obsessive and, and, yeah. um, you know, I, until literally last week, I was still replacing some shots that I didn't like. And, mm. and we're, we're literally doing the final mix and I'm still replacing shots here and there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, regrading just a little bit just to just to <laughs> a couple of stops so, um, uh, I, I imagine yeah mo- movies are like novels right they're not finished they're just abandoned right you get to just, a yeah, yeah that will be just it get to a point right it's like it's gonna have to do that i'm just gonna push this out right? the door now, yeah. i'm yeah. exactly at that point i'm at the point where it's like okay well ryan I didn't mention Ryan, who did an extraordinary job on the on the i mean what other thirty five thousand pound film can say they have a powerful fucking industry standard 5.1 mix you know oh right. god we, you right. know, right. we didn't I'm, even talk about the sound design it's no, fucking course, extraordinary. Which is extraordinary right? yeah. yeah i mean we didn't hear the 5.1 mix but even on the version that we had on the on the viewer and i i, I can't remember if i commented on it in the review or not i certainly meant to but fucking hell the sound design on this movie is yes. extraordinary. the sound like brilliant. you the decision to use breath a lot yeah i remember this so Ryan. Many that's like, Ryan. Yeah, Ryan, oh, that's on him. Yeah. God, it's so good. Yeah. Beautiful. And you just beautiful, realize, man. You realize what you're missing. You know what I mean? You realize mm-hmm. what you're missing from mainstream cinema. It's like you'll get that moment maybe once, and it will be because it's the super dramatic moment just before they burst through the door and everything explodes. But most of the time, yeah. but there's so many scenes in there where that's the only sound you hear is someone breathing. And it, it, it just, the, the amount of atmosphere it creates. Oh, mm-hmm. fucking fantastic. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. and that, that's that's on Ryan. He did he did he did an incredible job. He, he did most of most of the recordings on set, and then he did mm-hmm. all the the mixing in in his own studio. And uh, yeah, he's 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 magnificent. And then of course we have um, um, Mikael Sanchez, who did most of the music. Um, mm-hmm. uh, who did absolutely extraordinary work and then of course ryan and uh matt sheehan did the the final the final scenes music uh mm-hmm. in the studio right. which was which was amazing and we would then we had a few local artists giving us permission to use their songs for for background oh, music and oh, that's so true. you know it's it's been this is the other thing about about making films on such a low budget is you have to count on your community and right. they have they have yeah. to get behind it and with hereford hereford people uh, Hereford businesses and Hereford art scene, we they really stepped up and helped make this film possible. Wow. Um, so yeah, it, it was an amazing experience, and I rarely do have amazing experiences on set, but uh, <laughs> but that was that was that was brilliant. It was such oh a my God, weird, I... for such a bleak film. It was such a fun time. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> it really was. Yeah. We had a good fun. But I, I sincerely hope that you it gets out there, man. I really yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. See, so we, I want people to see this, you know. I do, submitted yeah. to quite a lot of festivals, but then it's seeing whether they're they're gonna bite. I think if we can score a, if we can score a decent sized festival, we should have a snowball effect and, and, mm. and people want to see it. But but you know, a film that small with no with no major household name attached, mm-hmm. uh, it's it's difficult. Yeah. Sure, yeah. and it becomes it becomes wow. it becomes a numbers day numbers game. Partly, it becomes a luck game, right? I mean, it's just yeah. to get it in yeah. front of the right pair of eyeballs at the right it's, time. Yeah, but, yeah, right. exactly that. Yeah. Well, we're we're certainly pulling for you and pulling for the success of the movie. But and look, and anyway, like just fucking thank you for making it because it's fantastic. Yeah. And I mm, thank you. It's it's been a real it's been a real like yeah, but I, I, it has been a bit of a revelation for me certainly. Oh, um, sure. Totally. Um, well, thank it's been you. Absolutely yeah. incredible. To I be mean, uh, like for, just... for me, that that's the other thing is I I I always hope that my films, I have this I have this thing that this regret in life that I I've lived through the digital revolution, but it was it was a, it was more a whisper than it was a revolution, and I think mm. people haven't quite embraced yet what what yeah. the possibilities are to make no, tiny, tiny 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 films. All you yeah. need to do is pick up a pick up a a, a fairly inexpensive and i mean inexpensive yeah. you know it's In relative, relative of course yeah. uh camera and then learn some skills mm-hmm. and get going and what you can do is very little and, and a small crew yeah. mm. uh and I mean, it course, is happening but it's in very very specific areas yeah. isn't it you yeah. know i mean like yeah. the whole there are little like revolutions happening on YouTube and whatnot, for example, yeah. like the analog horror craze and that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, absolutely. And if it mm. if it inspires, you know, one or two people, I'm 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 happy with that. And again, yeah. I'm grateful to my crew, you know, to, to, to the people that, that helped make this film. Sure. The, the people that helped writing it, the people that were in it, everyone. The, it, you know, Pete, I mean we're talking about Pete. Pete also did all the cooking. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> He did all the cooking for 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 the cast and the crew. So oh, you know, superb! My so God, it's, um, it's it's been a really, really, really beautiful experience oh, with so some wow. some beautiful people and um, yeah. Well, you know, and that Amazing. you know, I think I think that I think that love and I, I do think that love comes comes through in the finished product. Yeah, I really do. It really I think does. It's, uh, yeah. Well, I hope so. I, so. I, I, and I also take the chance to thank all the people that contributed to that crowdfunding as well, because sure. uh, even, even though we didn't reach our target, you know, uh, it was it was a real beautiful effort from 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 people, mm. and then also the people that that uh, essentially at the end, once we'd failed to reach our goal, stepped up and decided to give us the money. So Red wow. and Younes and Pierre and and Eric and uh, Jerome and uh, you know. All, all these people, uh, Peter mm. Mahoney, all these people that went, all right, look, you know, we believe in the project. Here's some money. And, and if we lose the money, we lose the money. And we hope that we make a little bit of money for sure. them. But uh, it was a really beautifully, for such, again, for such a bleak film, it was it was a really beautiful mm. human experience. Wow. Well, it was a, it was a, it was a joy to see. It. And again, we're, we're very grateful yeah. for the early access. We'll be sharing oh, about it. I'll and 
I, I mean, I, I've got to say as well, man. I, I mean, I realise that you've literally just finished, but I can't wait to see what you do next either. No, oh, no. Yeah, please, I'm really please excited. Loop, man, I'm really excited. I, um, yeah. We yeah. have projects. We have projects. Cool. Uh, but as always, being being a true indie means we have to wait to see where this one lands. Of course. Because, of course. because I'm not going to spend a year of my life writing a, a, a half a million film. <laughs> and then not, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then not be able to, to make it. So I have to sure. wait a little bit and see where this lands and then then we figure it out that's cool well keep us in the loop man absolutely yeah and before we go by the way jonathan is there anywhere people can find you online oh yeah oh yeah i mean i'm I'm fairly vocal on on social media on facebook is where i'm i'm the most present i tend to accept any friend requests so go for it if you find me (laughs) uh on on facebook i'm fairly easy to get a hold of if you can deal with my my constant rants about things then that's uh... <laughs> <laughs> to be fair if they're listening to this <laughs> to be they're, honest, they're used to that yeah situation. honestly <laughs> they are so used to that they are so used to that well facebook is where it's at for me most of the time i'm an old fart so every other social network i haven't figured out yet um, well that's okay because they're all collapsing so it's <laughs> fine. I was going to say yeah, they all seem to be getting bought out by billionaire yeah. Nazis and then and then off, destroyed so. amazing yeah, exactly. absolutely right. destroyed what, so what that's the world fine. we live in Oh yeah, that's yeah. the world. It's almost it's almost like a metaphor for the uh, you know imminent climate collapse. <laughs> but yeah, there you go. Yeah, well, that's, yeah true. that's that's what yeah. I've been telling people. To be honest, you know, <laughs> it's an example of what billionaires are doing to the planet and to yeah. our societies. Today, oh, Twitter, to tomorrow, the world. Mind. Yeah, pretty much. Anyway, oh. good. Well, and on the, on that depressing note, um, yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Jonathan. And yeah, I mean, I, I will. I'll, I'll speak to you again, certainly on on right off. Absolutely, yes, please. Uh, mm. That'll be great. And uh, again, please keep us in the loop, man, because whatever's oh, going on next, yeah, I am. We're up for it. We're totally up. You we're know. Up. <laughs> and right. you guys have been thanked in the end credits anyway, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. No, I couldn't yes. believe that. I was. Yeah. Uh, that was <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, yeah. I still can't quite. Yeah. That well, was, no, you. that's the that's the least we could do. You know. Appreciate oh, it. thank you so so much. Uh, of course. And uh, thank you guys for listening along at home. That's derelict, by the way, guys. Yeah. If you get the chance to see it, please. Ah, oh, do so. Do you know, so. Just, just, just if, if you know anywhere that if you if you know if you have any connection at all to any kind of film area or like people like yell at them until they like buy it or show it because yeah, yeah 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 just shout at them until they make because it's it's great. You need it in your life. Absolutely. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks. Okay, guys. Bye-bye. Bye for now.